Alrighty then. Hello! Hello everybody, welcome to another stream. It's your favorite neighborhood nerd, Wedding Potatoes, and I'm going to be uh, talking about Guild Wars. We're going to be playing factions, we're going to be having some fun. Um, I'm trying to sort something out. So basically now that the videos, I do almost like a, a, a Q&A mini thing at the end of most videos. Um, it means I can use a lot more Little Big Adventure audio on the end slate. Uh, and it gets to a bit of the song that I really like. If you guys uh, know the the, the, the the song that appears at the end of every video, the uh, Little Big Adventure 2 Emerald Moon, I think it is, or it's the Empire, it's one of those two. Um, you've all, you're probably very familiar with my normal, like, catch-in and the kind of very ambient... What's the term for that genre? Uh, but, you know, the, the, the kind of synthy, uh, atmospheric music, and then it bursts into the, the more orchestral section, which is when the end slate comes up. Um, that's all well and good and you're all probably familiar with that but the song itself as well a little bit later there's these really beautiful like desperate violins that come in and it's gorgeous it's amazing I love it so much but you guys never get to hear it until now now that I do these like comment sections on there because right, I speak for a bit then the audio can come back in which gives more time to get to the good part and every LP I've done since this has started uh, I've you know, I've, I've been manually messing with it and me manually messing with the audio balance and manually, which isn't ideal. So today I was trying to set up um, things a little bit differently. And normally when I would sample some music from a game or something, if I'm going to use in a video, I'd like to just go to YouTube and I'd pull it. But uh, I really want you guys to hear the first party thing. Now, I happen to remember that that old game, if you plug the CD in the drive, you could play it as a game, or you could literally just browse through it and treat it as an OST, just straight off. And a lot of games used to do that in the early, mid, late 90s. Uh, so I was trying that, um, but uh, I realized I don't know where the disc is. So, But I do own it on GOG, and I've owned it on GOG for a very, very, very long time. So I'm using GOG for the first time in ages uh, to try and get this download so that I can then browse it and get pull the actual track and I'm realizing GOG is like totally different since the last time I touched good old games they now have their prop a full-on like client that competes with Steam and stuff which they want me to sign into and this and that and it's just a, that's basically all of a sudden I've lost 40 minutes of my life uh, without even getting to the actual meat of the work which is kind of annoying but uh, yeah it'll be good when that's set up and uh, I really really do love that music and it will be nice to play around with that for the first time in a long time yeah GOG's great GOG Galaxy is okay yeah I mean I've always been very very fond of GOG and I do have quite a few games on there mostly freebies and very cheap things but uh, good old games that I really like I've picked up on there you know uh, more pe other people are more hysterical about DRM and stuff than I am frankly and ever have been but I, I, I get why they've always been uh, loved. Well, there was another... Yeah, Discord. Discord are setting up a thing where they're going to be selling games as well, aren't they? Uh, which is interesting. Now, I'm actually technically a Discord partner. Which is not a particularly high-regarded, uh, esteemed position to be in. Frankly, there's a billion of them and they're happy to get as many as possible. But what that theoretically should have meant is that... Actually, when I signed up to become a partner, they said they were going to send me a t-shirt and a hoodie and stuff, and they never did in the end. The bastards. I never got any of that physical stuff. Maybe I should contact someone about that. But I, sh I get, like, a few little minor perks. Our Spud Club Discord has got a unique URL and stuff just because we are partners with them. Um, and I wonder, though, when they start selling games to compete with Steam, whether their partners will get, you know, links and things. I don't know. That might be interesting if they do that. I should look into all of that. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. What I'm waiting for is someone to build the client to own all clients. Can you imagine? Somebody makes some kind of really intuitive, rock-solid, sturdy super client that you feed your Steam information, you Steam your, you feed your origin information, you your GOG information, all of that stuff. And then you can just run the super client and it should hook them all together. Can you imagine that? And someone builds an infrastructure for that? That would be top dog. That would be very, very, very cool. And then I think a lot of gamers would stop being so frustrated with um, platform wars, which is essentially what's going on right now. Uh, but, yeah. 
Anyway, um, I'm gonna go get some coffee, but the intro won't take very long. Literally just boiling the cup. There's nothing else to do. I, I'm not gonna bother messing around uh, with GOG. We'll figure out a UI skin to run, and I'm gonna make another build, another guild, uh, build, and we're gonna go in. We will do more than one mission today, I promise. We'll probably, by the end of today, I'm hoping to be out of the city. We've made very little progress on the, this weekend streams, very little. So how about now that it's Monday, we actually push through a little bit. As far as I recall, we don't have too much to get to Tanakai Temple and beyond. And, uh, yeah, we don't have to be super exhaustive. So, yeah, we will uh, get through. We'll play another Ritualist variant. Should be kind of fun. Well, if they make multiple super clients and then you need a super, super client? <laughs> I don't think it... I mean, what's the point in that, though? The, the idea of a super client would be it's some, like, nerd who's generous with his time and doesn't necessarily do it for profit. <laughs> But maybe I have too high expectations of the world. In fact, I definitely do. Uh, GOG really kept the torch burning before Steam added a bunch of back libraries and remasters started becoming a thing. Yeah, I mean, they're beautiful the way they do it. They actually go back and tweak the games and like... Um, oh, I hate it when this happens. But, for example, the Elder Scrolls 1 Arena... Uh, the first dungeon, and uh, let's not go into the specifics of why I know all this trivia. The, the end of the first dungeon in Arena... Uh, used to end with um, both the CD and the floppy version with uh, a question from one of the main characters and she'd basically say to you she'd give you a trivia question and the point is you had to go to your physical manual in your house and read and dig through the manual to a specific page to find the answer and that was like hacky old school ass DRM uh, people who pirated and download wouldn't have the physical media of the manual was the assumption and they wouldn't know what the answer to this question was um, so when GOG re-released that game the GOG edition is like a weird mix of the floppy and CD one but uh, you know they went in and they actually hammered out that little thing and you know the team there actually do a lot of fi first party work on the these odd products to get them functioning it's not just basic engine ports and optimizations and making sure that your little variant of DOSBox is running at the correct cycles and whatever. They actually change the content of the game itself. And I have a lot of respect for that. That, take, that takes employing a team who are diligent and do their work for countless little titles that you've never heard of. Um, you know, it's largely thankless, thankless, but I'm thankful. Anyway, seriously, got to get some coffee. Let's get the stream underway. I'll see you guys very soon.
then. <clears throat> We're all good, I think. We're all ready to go. Seems uh, almost kind of weird today's stream. It feels like we're starting and we're going for it. And um, I really didn't have to put much effort in setting the stream up or anything today. All right, well, hell, let's uh, head on in. Let's figure out a mod for ourselves. See exactly what we're going to do. It's great to see lots of people here again. I really hope we can continue getting the full eight-man party. Seems like we might be missing a little bit here, but we'll see. Uh, turning the audio on there for you all. Let me just check as well. Sound. Yeah, we're all good. That should be okay. Uh, right, so Igni gets first dibs because Igni is the lowest level. He's my level. Uh, so that's good. Other people can uh, send their requests now that I'm party leader. Uh, we're at the Napui quarter. Uh, we saw a pretty badass cutscene last uh, episode. So let's rewatch that, shall we now? Uh, it might kick me out of the party when I do this. All is as it should be. It's time now to become closer to the start. So, but quite a lot happened in the story. Is the thing we really glossed over because we were pretty uh, talking about some completely irrelevant stuff, basically. But uh, we've learned about the Oracle of the Mists, a dude who we should be able to find right here in this outpost. He's called Soon, and um, basically he's the creator of the envoys. They're very vague and non-specific about how a lot of this functions, uh, but we're dealing with like a lot of kind of high level, I don't want to say pantheon style stuff here in Cantha, but we're dealing with their interpretation of the stars and other planes of reality and celestials and it's kind of very Cantha specific. Uh, and they kind of just lay it on very thick for us here. We've also met now uh, a woman named Nika, who's a member of a prestigious guild, the Obsidian Flame. And she's a descendant of the great assassin to bring down Shiro all those years ago. Let's rewatch the cutscene and see how this guy doesn't have time to be gone. What was the line? I can't remember. But we'll, re we'll rewatch this and that will get us back in the mood. And uh, yeah, we'll figure some things out. Let's do it. Replay the mission cinematic. I wondered when I would be seeing you. My name is Soon. I am the Oracle of the Mists. I was sent here to- I know why you have come here. You are not the first to seek my help. You will not be the last. What, what do I- The stars in the night sky cast their light down upon the world, making physical replicas of themselves. Kai Jundon, the Kirin, the embodiment of corruption, the being of pure good turned to pure evil. Juan sang the turtle dragon, the eternal paradox, not one thing or another, a reminder that we will never fully understand the mists. I, she, the phoenix, the representation of fiery eternity, awaiting those in the underworld. And finally, the mightiest of them all, Tamu the dragon, a constant reminder of atrocity, pain, and anguish. You must defeat the avatars of these four celestial bodies if you wish to become closer to the stars. Only then will you be able to see into the spirit realm and truly fight Shiro Tagachi. But how do I... Get to the avatars? Step through one of these portals and you shall be transported to the location you desire. Choose wisely. If you should perish while among the Celestials, I will not come help you. I understand. I doubt that. One more question. Bother me no more with this. Bother me no more Tangle with this. Tangle with the stars if you must but you will waste no more of my time. Bother me no more with this. So yeah, it's kind of cryptic and cool, you know, like um, there are avatars of the Celestials in a reminiscent way to how there are avatars of the gods. 
the result of doing what becoming Wei no Su is very similar to um, being uh, closer to the gods. In both worlds, we get to see into the spirit realm. It's kind of strange, you know? Uh, and they're just not very, very clear about exactly what uh, what the real true relation is, if any. Maybe this is one of those things where it's too much of a headache to even try and find a unifying theory behind it all. Uh, but check it out. You can get extra lore behind these guys by actually reading these. And, of course, we got the Napri Quarter uh, background itself. Though it appears to be just another of Kaineng's numerous slum districts, the Napri Quarter is actually home to the adepts who serve Soon, the mysterious Oracle of the Mists. Within these slums, they study the words and teachings of the Oracle while protecting the downtrodden in secret. If you wish to become close to the stars, this is the place to begin. I love that idea of, you know, um, utilizing a slum district. I mean, I guess in terms of just the development of the, the, the game and the campaign, it's resource efficient to make the Napoli Quarter look like just the rest of the city. But it's also quite, also quite a titillating, fun idea, I think, that you've got this very mystical, spiritually bound place with lots of ancient information and understanding built up in it. But it's very much seated in just as much a rotten hellhole as everything else around it. It's a fun juxtaposition. I, I like that a lot, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm happy they weren't scared to be resource saving on this. Uh, so yeah, and we get the, the extra lore with these guys, his high G, and we heard some little uh, descriptions of them in the cutscene. Honestly, l going into these descriptions, okay, I just gotta say, I get very enthusiastic about lots of different areas of Guild Wars lore, uh, and you know, it always seems to be hinting just enough at great depths beyond that gets me very excited, and... Everybody trying to join the party, by the way. I'm about to leave, so don't worry. Uh, we'll, we'll go through that again in a second. But um, I've been very excited about a lot of lore. Uh, but somehow, for some reason, this lore, to do with the Celestials, it just feels so foreign to the rest of the game and so removed. And it hits you so fast and thick with... I, I find I don't really often think about it or care about it, or care for deeper answers to it. I don't know, does anyone else in chat get that? Do you, like, I don't know, it's just something about this side of the world building. It's just so suddenly there and then so suddenly not there. And there are other, ex and you might think, well, obviously you're not gonna think about it because it's not really relevant to anything else, but there are other things that are suddenly there and then suddenly not there, you know? The, uh, the facets quest in Eye of the North. Uh, with the mysterious language and you know it was hinted again in Deepstone and all of that before that hint in Deepstone it that was really a thing that was just there and then not there aside from a Dermon Priory instance uh, reference and it captured me it captured me before Guild Wars 2 came out and it it, it captures me to this day even without the deads nodding back to it so why does this not satisfy me you know I've, I've said many 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 very nice people often say to me hey WP why don't you try like writing for this kind of stuff why you know and the answer is I know what I like but I don't know how to deliver what I like and I don't know the answer to why this doesn't capture me and I think the re the fact that I don't know the answer as to why this doesn't capture me it's a very good indication of the fact I would be a poor writer I would be poor in any position of authority I know how to appreciate what I enjoy or don't enjoy but the the reason why underneath what happens with my psychology I can try very hard to speculate but sometimes I'm just at a dead end and here I'm at a dead end I don't know why but what I'm trying to say is basically this isn't that interesting to me even though all the ingredients are there for it to be I mean look at this asset in the background look at all the orbits and things we see there what is this what, what does this represent it just feels maybe the answer is this just feels too tacked on and quickly dropped I don't know I just have a little confidence the devs care in the, in this regard and maybe that's the truth the long and short of it yeah, let's read it anyway hi G the Phoenix, the representation of fiery eternity in the underworld. I mean, how does that, does that really link to the underworld, Grenth's underworld? Uh, should I be expecting Wing 6 to have High G references to go, I mean? Um, High G was the youngest of eight sons from a, from a noble family long known for producing talented warriors. He didn't like to fight, preferring instead to wield his paintbrush with which he had an unsurpassed skill. One evening, his family was attacked by a neighboring warlord. Haiji was tortured and left for dead. But as the invaders swept down upon his two baby sisters, he arose, took up the sword he had so despised, and single-handedly killed every invader. When his grim task was complete, 
High G dropped to his knees and begged Grenth to see to it that his family's murderers found no peace in the afterlife. Grenth heard High G's prayers, dooming the souls of the murderers to an eternity of fiery torture. I mean, as a... What's the word for a really short, snappy story? I can't remember. There's a word for it. A, a, a literature term. Just to be clear, I, I, I studied linguistics, not literature, so I'm not very good with these things. But the, as a little snapshot story, it's kind of nice, you know? It's, it's, it's that level of grim I like from Guild Wars. I also wonder if these are more direct references and analogues to some something in Chinese or Japanese or Korean culture that the devs have melt and potted together. Uh, no, not short story. Parable. Maybe the word I'm thinking of is a parable. Would we call this a parable? But yeah, uh, and maybe my appreciation for it is a little bit lower because I don't see that connection, but yeah. Sorry for interrupting your LP session there, Tulip. Uh, Kwang Sang, here we go. The Turtle Dragon, the Eternal Paradox. Kwang Sang was a wizened old sage who spent his days dispensing helpful advice and delivering messages to and from the spirit realm. Again, they seem to have the underworld as a connection between them. When the emperor's daughter took sick with an unknown illness, Kwang Sang consulted with the spirits. This is kind of cool because it feels relevant to now, this unknown illness afflicting people. After gathering their advice, he returned to his emperor's side, relaying all that he had learned. Convinced of Kwang Sang's advice, the Emperor ordered the death of the oldest daughter of every household. And when it was done, he looked to his own daughter, sure she would be healthy once more. Instead, he found her cold body lying in her bed. It did not take Kwang Sang long to realize he had misinterpreted the riddles of the spirits. In grief and shame, he took the Emperor's sword and cut off his own head. So he uh, played a game of Sudoku there at the end. I mean, yeah, these are grim. These are much grimmer than I remember, actually. Why weren't these more firmly in my memory? I really like some of these. Jesus. The uh, little teenage edgelord in me is... Uh... <laughs> I was going to say something very rude there. Uh, is very excited right now. <laughs> uh, Tamu, <laughs> the dragon. A reminder of atrocity, pain, and anguish. Yeah, to be able to cut off your own head is kind of mental as well. I mean, the logistics behind that. Tamu was an empress well known for her generosity and kind spirit. The people of her lands were all children, and she made sure none went without food and shelter. When the Naga attacked, and this is cool too, hearing about the Naga within the context of these little stories, her private guards urged her to flee the city that she might save her own life. But Tamu would not abandon her children. She called to her people to take up arms and defend themselves against the Naga, and she herself went into the streets to do battle. Unfortunately, the Naga overpowered Tamu and her people, keeping her alive to witness the torture and murder of every single person in the city. I mean, this is a bit over the top, isn't it? Jesus Christ, OTT. But maybe the nature of this in-universe document is that it is exaggerated within the universe's limits. Do you get what I mean? So it's cool in that case how, you know, the Oracle of the Mist dispenses quite extreme information that's probably not got a basis in the reality of Guild Wars. We don't have to take this at face value is what I'm saying, and that's what's interesting about it. There could be some unreliable narration base baked into this parable. Enraged beyond reason, she managed to break from her bonds and cool down fire from the heavens, which streaked through the streets in the form of a dragon, incinerating the Naga attackers. So what is the lesson to be learned there? Speaking of the LP and Guild Wars being dark, the wahoo at the end of today's episode was perfect after the horrible thing that happened. Was that real serious? really just today's episode? Man, I've got two more recorded since then. Uh, people on Patreon can see quite a bit ahead, I think, already right now. You guys will see another episode go up after this stream, sometime after this stream. No promises. I had to cancel the upload while we're going, but yeah. Yeah, that Super Mario reference, that was really silly. I'm glad you liked that because it felt a bit tonally weird to go to that after the char short story right okay now i'm gonna leave now pre quarter just for a quick second because there is something very fun i wanted to show you all um back up at the capital to do with you mod i mentioned it at the start of these episodes but we're eight parts in now uh and i'm sure that some of you may have forgotten what i was talking about let's go back to dark glass let's go back to high res skill icons but not clear skills i'm not gonna run clear skills now 
The power of you mods. Remember, all it would take is one genius person to get this working for Guild Wars 2. Think about the applications in Guild Wars 2 when you see the applications of Guild Wars 1. We can take any texture we like in the game and flip it for something else. So it can give us a spirit radius on our compass. It can give us aesthetic considerations for elsewhere on our user interface, as we can see here. It can more clearly and plainly list out northwest, south, and east. It can change transparency and alpha channel uh, application for the user interface. It can do anything we like. It can change the color of the skills we use. It can also, and this is a little bit tacky, but bear with me, it can bring Winter's Day, baby, to Kaineng. Oh, it's so white. <laughs> Look at this mod someone made. Come on, I love stuff like this. So, Winter's Day is not a Canthan festival. It's not supposed to be here. The devs never first party supported it. So, players said, do you know what? Screw it. You mod exists. Let's add snow and presents. Look at this. Yay. And trees and lovely mistletoe and snow everywhere. Beautiful. Don't let the whiners and the misers and the picky nerds in chat dissuade you, potential developer. This you could create for Guild Wars 2. If UMod came to Guild Wars 2, we could add Winter's Day to the Black Citadel. Uh, we could add Winter's Day to Brisbane Wildlands for all we care about. In these astounding quality textures here. Um, add all this and more for the low, low price of someone... Deve developing you mod. Go Google it. Figure it out. Save our FPS in Guild Wars 2. And we'll see this go. Look at this banner here. Dwayna versus Grenth. Live from Lion's Arch this Winter's Day. Look, they're advertising for it here in the city. Look at the effort that's gone in here. Beautiful. Alright. You could... Uh, so, in one of the episodes of the LP, I don't know which one it is, I go into a room and I look at a, a, an open tome on the bookshelf, and it's got really low resolution new, cri uh, new crying on it, which you can kind of read, but not fully, and it's very low res. If you, dear developer, make you mod a thing for Guild Wars 2, we can up-res those textures, and we can make it all more legible, and we can write our own little things and put them in there. Come on, alright? We can create texture packs. We can bring Guild Wars 2 into the late 2018s for those with enough VRAM. Alright. Look, I don't care how they did it if they just removed a texture. I'm pretty sure it... I mean, would a removed texture be white? Wouldn't it be purple to say that there's nothing there? They've obviously put more work in. But, I mean, yes, it's very lazy with the white down here. But, come on. This is some mod someone made back in probably like 2007 for text mod. And to this day, it creates a dramatic difference in kining. And I have massive respect for everyone who did this. And unless you guys get a got a better mod, there you go. I think it's great. So there you have it. That's what I wanted to show in Kaineng. Let's go back to Napui and let's get the story going. I, I, I brought this one person with me, Kim Rusar. <laughs> in these particle effects of snow falling. Well, uh, that you mod probably couldn't do, but if you took an area that was raining in Guild Wars 2, you could probably retext the, the raindrops to look like s snow. <laughs> it would still sound like rain, though. So, I mean, there are limits, obviously, but with a bit of creativity, who knows what may be accomplished. Okay, guys, here we go, team teammates. Let's accept everybody. Here we go. Asia T. What's with these level 20 devs? Everyone's level 20 here. Ooh, 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 ooh. Are we going to start accepting level 20s? Stinking, filthy level boosters. People playing side quests and actually trying and not skipping through the content. I'm the Guild Wars 1 equivalent of a casual Guild Wars 2 player right now. I just want to skip through. Nah, give me to 80 as quick as possible. I need to go, go, go. That's who I am right now. I, I have no care for side quests or exploration getting stinking experience. I've just got to beat the game and get through the grind. Alright, it seems... Uh, who do we want to pick then? What's our comp? I love how I've had no regard for adding any support this entire time. I guess we'll add Essence of Faith since they were the first one to request on the list. And they're RIP primary. I feel bad every time I say no to Smith because every stream Smith's been here and most most opportunities to join the party he's not made, it, made the cut. He's, he's made it a few times, though. We'll go Essence of Faith. We'll give lots of people an opportunity here. So there you go. 
All right, our job, become closer to the stars. We have to kill each of these Celestials. Now, there's a really fun thing that happens with the actual mechanics this instance, and I'll describe that once we get inside. Take a sip of coffee. You could give Cantha slum textures something that doesn't look like giant stacks of broken wood. Absolutely, you could, yes. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about here. We're thrown into the instance. I like to believe the idea is we drank some potions, some salves, we started hallucinating or some crap, and that this isn't actually in the real world what we're doing, but it kind of is. So here, look, the Celestials and their Guardians have been summoned. You must defeat them if you wish to become Wayno Su. Upon the destruction of a Celestial, its essence will spread, creating countless similar Celestials that will endlessly return. Much like the stars in the night sky. Oh, Elder Dragons, guys. The difficulty of this task increases with each Celestial you encounter. Since you will face not only that Celestial, but the essence of those others you have already defeated. As well as the Celestial's guardians. Pass through an orb to begin your trial. You will find yourself transported to a location near your Celestial you must defeat. So there's so many elements here that the devs just gloss over, frankly. I mean, we get those parables about each of these things but I mean what actually happens here when you look at the skybox it's all like crazy and messed up and starry and trippy um and you'll see more interesting elements so straight away first we got four teleporters four portals each representing one of the bosses one of the celestials I should say and depending on which one we pick it will take us to um uh you know that one first and we can kill it first when it dies, it explodes and splits itself. We'll talk about the mechanic when we actually score a kill. So the point is, which one do you want to start with, right? So we can load in a mod that gives us guidance on where to go. So this is just a timer for us. I guess it doesn't matter which one we start with. Let's just start on the far left, I guess. The most optimal way of doing it, basically, the portal you pick will dump you into the instance in a different area, so you've got that to consider, but also the type of mob you kill. If you kill a really, really hard boss first, then there's going to be loads of mini versions of that boss plaguing you at every turn, so there's like an optimum strategy. If you were to go to the Guild Wars 1 wiki page for this mission, there'd be loads of different things listed out, because hey, there's actual gameplay here. I like, I love this. Look, there's still Christmas presents around. <laughs> what a weird mix. Okay, so... And look at this. What the hell? This is from text mod, uh, from you mod as well. I'm sure of it. Yeah, so I like to think we're tripping. I mean, it's very strange, isn't it? But maybe we're not. I mean, what are the odds in the entire the city will be like this? These runes, very cool. So we uh, can now see that the route we want to go is we want to follow these red dots. Which, uh, do you know what? For my convenience, I will keep the mini-map there. But I'll put it under the face cam so it doesn't clog down the stream. Beauty. Oh, someone's using a lot of spirits here. Oh, I never changed my build. Ah, rip. Whatever. We, we'll, we'll get a move on. I, we got to get a move on. I could just spam Necrosis at the end of the day. It doesn't even matter. Uh, so here's another facet of this. There are defenders and fighters during this. They're called Star Sentinels and Star Lights and Star This and Star That. And you'll notice they're Tengu. And at no point in the game's history did the developers actually properly explain what the hell the Tengu involvement is with this. Again, I kind of hand wave it in my head canon that it's just a bit of a trip we're on. But yeah, the Tengu have some investment in this rite, in this ritual, which is very, very, very strange. Because it's only after this instance you start to find Tengu that live in the city and you don't get enough info. But like, the idea of Tengu living in Kainang is fucking cool to me. I really like the idea of it. But they don't really, uh, they don't give us that, that, that detail about it. And even in Winds of Change, they never gave us that detail about it. Even though the, the Tengu have a big stake in Winds of Change. As we may see as these streams go on, if that's what you guys vote on. Um, so anyway, there we go. We killed the first one. That was the Kirin. And having done that, we're now going to be fighting a million monks the whole way through the instance. Possibly, and, and ritualists, I guess, maybe. No, no, I think they're just monks. Possibly a bad move, because they'll tank up everything we fight. But maybe not a bad move. I don't know. There we go. There's a necrosis for them. I kind of don't want to use an item or anything right now. The cool thing is, because I have another spirit spammer on my party, I don't even really need to use vampirism. I might even be overlapping with vampirism from him. So yeah, these guys dropped feathers. This was actually a reasonable feather farm back in the day, if I remember, just because they were worth having. 
Um, so yeah, we have the signet capture here as well, and I don't think there's a rip boss here. There might be a necro boss, and we can do something with that. Uh, and yeah, we'll just keep following the red dotted line. Tengu and Kaineng wouldn't be free range chicken. That is racist, and I will not hear any of it. Just because they're a video game society doesn't mean that's not a damaging outlook for you as a human being. I am going to complain about that to, uh, I don't know who, whoever will listen on the internet, <laughs> basically. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't, don't call the Tengu chicken. You know what makes me sad? Truly devastatingly sad. When and if we get Tengu in Guild Wars 2, people will have the character named Chicken. And I think that's gross. I think anyone who's ever considered it should be ashamed. Ashamed of the mere thought. If I could police your thoughts on that, I would. Alright, let's go up around this way. I'm going to keep collecting this stuff and we'll just salvage it down. So it's not uncommon to see a Guild Wars 1 stream where their bag is just like this the whole time. And as they collect, they just salvage down as they move between pools. Especially if you're doing like a multiplayer thing. If I was say a smite roll or a famine roll in a, in a three-man doa run or something way back in the day. I would be like this with my inventory open. I wouldn't actually be using the F9 menu. but I'd have, And I'd just be salvaging as I run through. Because basically once you've bonded the person up. You can kind of just sit and watch crazy numbers come in. <laughs> so uh, yeah. You'll call your Tengu character Pingu. How do I feel about that? Um, Pingu is more acceptable. Pingu's not a bad guy. Pingu's alright. I will accept that that might not be the worst thing in the world. Ancestor's Rage? Ah, he was out of range for the proc. That's a shame. This build's actually not too bad. We hit over 100 there with one of our lightning skills. Which one was it? It's not Spirit Burn. It's Channeled Strike. I guess I should just focus on Channeled Strike a little bit more than I have been in the past. But there's so many ranges in... So you, there you can see the advantage of Necrosis. Necrosis doesn't care if they have resistance. There I necrosis, but I didn't have the qualifying thing. This is why it's good to have necros casting like suffering and stuff, because what suffering does is um, spreads mass degen and hex application everywhere, making necrosis just such a spammable thing. Right now, we don't seem very condi or hex heavy, which I'm fine with. I mean, I'm not quite. I, my build only contributes. What I can do is I can spirit burn to combo off of my other ritualist spirits in the area, which applies burning, which then chains straight into necrosis. So my burning procs the necrosis hit. So here, look, we can vampirism, spirit burn, necrosis. And I know he had a hex on him anyway, but we can do that into a channeled strike maybe afterwards and then drop the item at his feet. Got some good heals. Man, I love Healing Breeze. Not even that highly rated a skill, to be honest. But um, it's an iconic monk one to me. Continue to move along. Kwang Sang. This mod is so good. Having this just laid out all the time is so good, guys. It's going to make these streams a dream. So much more comfortable to run with. Shall we try and nail a good spike? Let's go Crawl's Dao Shen. Ancestor's Rage and the Channeled Strike drop. Let's do it big time, okay? We have to wait till the, the ashes come back, so we won't do it on this boss. But I'm going to try it in a minute. Oh, there you go. Here we go. So, we'll summon this. Ancestor's Rage, Channeled Strike, drop. Yeah! Feels good. Oh, he used Grenth's Balance to heal a lot there. So, Grenth's Balance is pretty good against minions and things because. Uh, wait, is it? I always forget how Grenth's Balance is. No, it's probably bad against minions. Never mind. It was a big heal for him, though. So, if you look behind us, there's actually enemies respawning. You guys, as Guild Wars 2 players, might not be very enthusiastic about that or ha have any real note or consideration for it. But listen, respawning mobs was not a common thing in Guild Wars 1. The whole flow of the gameplay and stuff kind of relied on when stuff dying it stayed dead and so it was actually an interesting shake up to the formula for this quest i know that sounds really bizarre and it's going to be just so uninteresting to you guys but respawning stuff was not the status quo and so that's why this mission as well amongst the other mechanics kind of has a bit of a, a different vibe and ring to it Oh, can we capture from the turtle? Good point. Yeah, good point. Here we go, guys. So our first leak now, I didn't describe this in the streams. Basically, uh, once you get to the city and to certain thresholds in the game, you can buy signets of capture. Now, what this will do is it lets you capture skills from the bosses you kill. In general, well, let's just stick on that point. 
And what that means is you still pay the same price for a signet of capture. So it's not cheaper. And I, personally, I think that's a mechanic the devs should have done. I, I think it should have been cheaper. And people should have been encouraged to use signet of captures as much as possible. If that eased your financial burden because you were capping from bosses, it would have been another facet to the skill capture system that would have been really fun. This whole system is kind of um, a result of some much more old school, very early game beta design in Prophecies that was later ironed out and whatnot, which we don't really have to talk about. But it's a signet and, the, you know, signets with the rings and the eight skills and much of that was refined by the time the game got into the most consumers' hands. But, uh, yeah, um, in addition to being able to capture skills, and sometimes, like this boss here, this body will never despawn. And we can capture skills and maybe he has a, a necro skill that we can't buy until the Jade Sea. Or maybe he has, you know, back on Xing Jie, we could have bought a skill before, we could have captured the skill before, and it was a city-based skill, you know, uh, before we got to the city. That's, that sequence break idea is also a perk, but again, is very underutilized, and in most situations, you didn't really do it. So, really, it wasn't even that rewarding using this for regular skills. So, you're wondering, hey, WP, why is this a thing then, if it's not cheaper and it doesn't let you sequence break mostly? It's because the bosses in the world sometimes have skills that no regular vendor would ever be able to sell to you. A special classification of skill known as an elite and this is the only way to get them in general sometimes there were ways to break it but for most of the skills and here so look at it it's got a golden name um a bit like our res grenth's balance is this elite which is a very particular and fiddly necro skill uh you can see we could get any of these other ones but many of these will have been for sale in the city anyway so yeah we can capture grenth's uh balance and this gives us this skill permanently also if you read the cap signet it says signet of capture uh, gives you 250 experience for every level you have earned up to this point if you got an elite Which is kind of another tacked on mechanic that's mostly irrelevant Especially once we got into factions and nightfall days because everyone was nearly level 20 all the time And it's kind of weird that that scales the more levels you have It gives an impression that you were supposed to be elite skill capturing way back as early as level 9 and 10 and 11 and stuff Which you're not so yeah, you know, it's it's got its artifices and some weird aspects to it to this day and anachronisms. But there you go. Anachronistic properties. Because of that, we leveled up to level 19 and we got Grenz Balance permanently on our bar. Now, these skills are basically super powerful. Super powerful doesn't mean they have potent effects. It means that they're strong energy, cooldown, and cast time all considered. Some elite skills function as auto attacks but they're really good auto attacks so that the, what's quality about them is that they're low cast time or that they're low energy costs or that they recharge fast if you get an elite skill that also costs a lot and takes ages to recharge and you know then you've got some ridiculously potent effect but there's a billion different ways that the elite skills can be worthwhile and the elite skill kind of defines your builds a lot of the time in this game you know how in guild wars 2 one of the most build defining things is like the weapon you equip i guess i don't know there's a bit of debate there maybe it's your specializations but the really big build defining thing for Guild Wars 1 is the elite. You know, if we vote really heavily on channeling, we probably want a channeling elite. So just imagine this now. An elite skill associated with a primary attribute that also is really costly. You know, then you're talking about big badass profession de de uh, defining skills. Uh, and yeah, that's skill capturing. It's something many people miss from Guild Wars 1. And there you have it. So we did get some more attributes from the level up. I'll put it into spawning power there. We're only one point overflown. And there you go. Right. So uh, let's continue on our adventure. That's elite skill capturing. Now we have to buy another signet of capture and we can go again. You, there is one way to have multiple elite skills at once. And that's that if we went into this instance with lots of signets of capture on our bar. And we caught lots of them at once. But for all practical purposes, that wasn't really great. Because the second we go back to an outpost, we lose. and we, It boils us back down. Signets of capture are technically PvE skills. So they compete for those three slots that Vampirism uses and Necrosis uses. So if I have Vampirism and Necrosis on my build... I can only ever have one uh, signet of capture after that because then we're three out of three. Um, so yeah, we'll probably just keep rotating this last slot as we explore. And hopefully we'll find a ritualist boss soon to get a ritualist elite skill. 
This is a Necro one. It's kind of an interesting Necro one as well because it's a zero attribute one, which is really weird. It's an, an elite skill that you can never scale according to your stats. So it's as efficient right now as it will ever be, whether I was Necro primary or anything. So here's how it works. Um, if the target... It does nothing unless they have more health than us, first of all. Okay? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'll just read out how it says. I won't try and jump the gun. Because I don't remember these things well enough anymore. If the target has more health than us, we gain half of the difference between our two healths. And they lose half the difference between our two healths. Okay? If the foe has less health than us, that happens in reverse. And so I know what a lot of you are thinking. Holy crap. If I go to a boss that has 20,000 health and I have five, can't I cast this to nuke it? And that's what everyone thinks. And that is not how it works. And that is a misunderstanding. And that is baked into the game to not be allowed. It's half the difference between our healths. So if I have five health and I go to a 20,000 health boss and I cast Grent's Balance, I will instead do 250 damage because my max is 500. Does that make sense? So uh, the most I'll ever do is about 200. And 200 is a big proc, but it's reliant on me being near death to get. So it's kind of like, what's the point? In theory, we could do a really high vitality build and maybe get some value out of it. You know, interestingly enough, using Cruel was... Um, if we use Mighty was Verizon, Mighty was Verizon buffs our max health. And maybe we could have a range on our team that casts Symbiosis, which is a nature ritual which increases my max health and his. But because my max health is higher now and then I can tank myself down with sacrifice skills as a necro and then use Grant's balance to, you know, equalize the difference. That's the idea. You're a high vitality necro and you sack your health down through sacrifice abilities and then you Grant's balance up. If this was Guild Wars 2 design, that would be a sacrifice ability itself probably and it would sack first and then it would proc afterwards. The devs bake all that stuff in and make all the skills do a million things these days. But in Guild Wars 1, it was about those kinds of synergies. Um... And it is not a very good skill, frankly. As far as I knew, there was never... Oh, God, I keep casting Necrosis instead of Channel Strike. I personally, for my time playing Guild Wars 1, never had a truly amazing application of that skill. So here I'm dead because I charged into the most dangerous of the Celestials here, the Essence of the Dragon, because I was talking to you guys about Grand's Balance and I'm a moron. Um, and here's another thing. As I build up Death Penalty, that, that penalizes my max health. And so... I kind of lose even more value from it. You know, a side of Guild Wars 1 design that's fun, though, is Grenth's Balance can still have value to Guild Wars 1, even if, as a player skill, it's not that good in any format. You know, it might not be great in GVGs, it might not be great for gimmicks in RA, it might not be great in TA, it might not be great in AB, it might not be great in Endgame, it might not be great anywhere, but... It's kind of an interesting thing to put on mobs in the open world, isn't it? As we saw, we already had an interesting interaction with it playing. And that's a thing that Guild Wars 1, as we talked about on a previous stream, is, is kind of good for. You know, like the balance in some ways is saved by these things. We're going to go up this way now. We're going to follow uh, Koss. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Grand's Balance. There is a Ritualist boss in the Explorable Zone right outside this town once we're done. Ooh, there you go. So there, I was on max health, and so was he. So I cast Grenth's Balance, and I did zero, and I took zero. Uh, I, guess, I suppose there's the other thing, which is like the reverse, where we can actually hurt ourselves. I'll show you that. Um... I mean, it's an interesting utility concept. So here, I'll wait till the Essence of Turtle is nearly dead, and then I'll cast Grenth's Balance. And what happened here? I chunked myself because we balanced ourselves out and I went down by half the difference. Yeah? Uh, and you might think, well, what the hell's the point in that? But as a necro, maybe there's something you get value of as a sacrifice from being low on health. Maybe. I can't really think of anything at this time. But, you know, uh, I'm sure there's some kind of enchantment that, 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 that values that. And so, you know, it's an interesting, like, utility. And that's kind of the thing. That's as a no attribute thing that maybe you'd find... People get valuable. But yeah, um, continuing along. 
We're almost done with the quest here, by the way. This story, the, the, by the way, the big flavor with this instance is navigating what is essentially a maze. Look at this bit. Look at Winter's Day. Here, I'll turn this off. Another big thing with you mods. We don't like it. We turn it off straight away. Boom. Uh, yeah, well, what, the thing with this instance is it's like you're in a maze. Things are respawning. How do you get from one to the other? It's kind of flirting with that idea that the, the city is a labyrinth. And you're sort of butting your head. That's the whole point. So to be able to efficiently move through and not get grounded down. Because remember, we're in a campaign mission. There's no res shrines. Uh, to be able to get through comfortably is the name of the game. So this is one of those instances that kind of breaks by running a guide. Just as we are. But there you go. This, uh, Ancestor's Rage. Drop that. Let's Spirit Burn. it To burn him. To Necrosis. Straight away afterwards. I love how much we chunk with that. Oh, a cockatrice stuff. If you sacrifice on an easy mob to get your health low and then recast on a difficult mob that now has high health. Yeah, that's a good idea. So it's on a 10 second cooldown. So it's a hell of a wind up. So I can get myself low on this star sentinel. Friendly fire damage of 200. And then I can communicate with my healer friends or, you know, do a lot of micro with my heroes and not use henchmen. Something only available once Nightfall came out. Uh, to then, you know, try and balance out this turtle. But look at that. I did 16 damage to that turtle. You know, it's just a lot of micro. It's not a great skill, honestly. A fun skill. And one of those ones that we used to spend days uh, thinking about and theory crafting. But for practical applications, I'm not sure I have any memories of it. Here we go. The last boss is going to be up here. Yeah, Dead Zealot, welcome to the stream. You do have quite a lot to catch up on. So here, if I walk in early, oh, lightning surge, man! What a, what a! I used to run that a lot on my mesmer, mesmer slash Ellie. That was one of the skills I used to fast cast. Oh, hundred and two. Oh god, they're weak to elemental damage. It's awesome. I want to run um toolbox so bad. You might find by the time the next set of streams comes out, I'll have toolbox on. Because I want to run a DPS meter. I want to. I want to see how we're all doing and stuff. I think it will be really interesting. And it's not going to be elitist and toxic and ridiculous. It will just be cool. We're all just messing around and having fun and playing different builds. It will be interesting to see if like one guy is carrying super hard, or how like we are comparing when we use like a single necrosis. Because we're not doing very well. We don't AOE on this build. We don't AOE much. I mean, this ancestor's rage might do okay, okay. but uh, you know, we could do a lot better. So here I'm super low, and I'm going to target, like, the Essence of Dragon. Oh, I've already been healed. <laughs> I, I tried. I tried. Uh. Here's the Phoenix, by the way. It's a Mesmer. Uh, that's just Necrosis. No, come on. We need a Hex or a Condi, people. There you go. Down it goes, and the quest is complete. Good job, team. I see that I have underestimated you. I'll say. Forgive my harshness. There are those who take the power of the stars for granted. The Celestial Ministry, perhaps? I see you have encountered them already. Unfortunately. The Ministry are nothing more than an overfed bunch of paper pushers. Good for little other than playing parlor tricks at a Naga Cub's birthday party! Well, you'll understand then when I don't welcome all of those who come looking to become closer to the stars. Now you will excuse me. I have much work to do. But... Go talk to an adept. Yeah, I need that on a soundboard as well. Go talk to an adept. Bother me not with this. Go talk to an adept. And for such a, a crucial character in the story, they really don't explain enough of his interaction with the important aspect, and that's the appointment of envoys and whatnot. Uh, here we go. Let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> 
You see how the flesh enveloped his chainmail there? That's really creepy and weird almost. Oh, God. The Rangers look just like Captain Keys from Halo 1. Are you an envoy? Yes. Are you here to take us to eternal paradise? You're not going to paradise. What, what are you going to do with us? I'm going to make you into my soldiers. You're going to fight for me. We won't do it. You can't make us. You will do whatever I tell you. Kneel. Bow before your new master. <laughs> this is, there's so many good sound bites. This voice acting is so good. Are you going to do anything to hurt us? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Bow before your master. We will not do it. <laughs> so bad. Okay. Uh, looking at chat now. What, what was this that someone said here? Um, sorry. Uh, I was in the mission. you got to understand I'm talking about stuff as I do. Uh, as I stream. Um, where is it? Last try. Can you talk about uh, your key bindings? Now, that's a very valid... Bother me no more with this. Go speak to an adept. Neon. <laughs> Uh, can I talk about my key bindings in GW1? Yeah, I'm using a Razor Naga. I talked about the bindings a lot. I set them all up on an earlier stream. I don't see why people watching this series should have to do it all twice at... because of your question there. So go back to the earlier stream and you will see uh, the answer. You can go bother an adept. That be the adept being me from a few streams ago. But uh, yeah. Uh, having an MMO mouse is really nice. Um, what was the other question? T -t 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 if I sacrifice... Uh, no, 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 no. It was about the damage type of Grenz Ballas. I think it's essentially pure damage again, yeah. Um, which you might now be getting the impression is quite common to Necro. It's not necessarily that common to the game. In the later years, certainly, and with a lot of the way that Mesmer worked, his armor ignoring damage and typeless damage. But uh, the vast majority of the game is not like that. And Really, I don't think it should even exist in the game, to be honest. I think it's uh, a dangerous road to be going on that Guild Wars 2 fully embraced. It's okay that Guild Wars 2 got rid of damage types and stuff, because just through the virtue of the movement and stuff, Guild Wars 2 is more than complicated enough of a game. It's fine. There's tons going on with Guild Wars 2. Uh, but Guild Wars 1, I think, thrived on having damage types, and uh, the whole typeless thing was a bit, a bit iffy. Right. Bother me no more with this, chat. Uh, if you need money at any point in this, those feathers are, like, worth 500 gold for 10 now. Are they really? Is feather farming, like, the bomb now? That's kind of cool. So we move on to Senji's Corner. Senji's Corner is a pretty prominent location because now that we're way no Sue, remember what happened when we become closer to the gods in Guild Wars 1? Uh, in Prophecy, sorry. Or when we take the Melanju Shrine in Nightfall? Uh, it's a big moment of new power for us, essentially, horizontally. This is where we can assign new secondary professions. Uh, however, I am not going to do that because at the start, I, wa I wanted that vote to have integrity as to what our second thing would be. And we barely touched Necro yet. And I don't need to bog down with the tumble things. Perhaps much later, a few more episodes down the line, we will actually change our secondary. But I have no hard and fast, fans, hard and fast plans for that yet. The Senji's Corner. Locals have dubbed this section of town Senji's Corner for the eccentric old man who lives there. Most think his odd riddles, nothing but the ramblings of an insane man. But those who take the time to listen can learn new paths. And that is referring to the fact that, yeah, we can uh, swap our secondary profession now. A bit hand wavy, really. But, uh, yeah, let's come over to a cane here. This is a new selection of skills as well. Uh, and the list has grown a lot now since uh, Kining Center proper. I don't know whether I want to go for a whole vote. 
Because I think the same thing... I will do one more vote. And if it comes out the same way, we're probably not going to vote for it anymore. Or I'll have to change it. And instead of voting on attribute lines, I'll, like, invent some concepts. And we'll vote on the concepts instead. But I will try one more attribute-oriented... Well, why don't we just do the concept idea? Let's do the concept idea. Thinking about Cyberpunk makes you want to play Cyberpunk game again. Hard and fast, more like old and set in his ways. I stole someone's idea and just claimed the name Krita Fried Karomi in Guild Wars 2. That is a cool Tengu name. Look, we're all going to look like mugs and morons if the devs never actually add it, though. I just feel like, I mean, does anyone else have that, like, gut feeling that it's like, holy crap, they did mounts really well. And the way they did that was, like, they just compartmentalized, they just took a team to just go really heavy on that idea, on that facet of an expansion, and it came out amazing. I, I just feel like that's such a, such a solid structure and institution to exist that they can just, instead of it being mounts as the thing next time, it's a new race is the thing next time. Do you get what I mean? I just, I don't know, that it just fills me with enthusiasm and confidence for it, even though it's probably 100% misplaced. Uh, her name is Akane. It means brilliant red in Japanese. Okay, Akane. There you go. Sorry for getting that wrong. I apologize to the Japanese fans out there who enjoy and adore Japan and everything has to be exactly pronounced correct. Cherry Tune saving my back there. Okay. How about we vote on a build template I set up? No, that's silly because I'll have to build loads of build templates in front of you all and then it doesn't save time. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. We've got to keep moving. So I'm going to go to straw poll now and I'm just going to hash out some ideas, some concepts for builds, which you guys will vote on. And, um, and then we'll build the build and the specifics of it afterwards. Doing the build template first is like nuts. It would be way too much minutia that then just gets thrown in the bin when people don't vote on it. So, watch, what build? What, what are some ideas? Restoration, healer, uh, melee buffer through weapons uh, and curses and barbs and stuff. Um, what else is there? Uh, lightning nuka, which is kind of what we are right now, but refined. What other concepts are there? Um, necro, mansa, pure minions uh, with the flesh golem and stuff uh, spirit spammer pure minions a hybrid spirit and minion spammer um, what else is interesting about ritualists and necro as we currently have dealt with um, rare spirit spammer where we just use like lots of weird spirits um, I don't know. I'll put it this way. Defensive spirit spammer. Um, there you go. Right. So you guys have got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different types of builds there. You can only vote on one. You can't vote on multiple. Uh, let's see what you guys want to see and I'll read them out again. The idea for build one is some kind of restorative healing uh, Writ that you know buffs people's health, but also uses defensive spirits and whatnot to supplement the build uh, a melee buffer who uses splinter weapon brutal weapon, but also like orders like barbs and uh, Stuff like that to increase the damage that our assassins and rangers and things do without we wouldn't vi get much visual feedback on that But we'd feel like happy smug little nerds uh, a lightning nuka, but we figure out a bit better what what we're doing with that. Uh, we could just become a necromancer minion mancer and use like the shambling horrors and the jagged horrors and the double minions and a flesh golem and stuff when we cap it and all that kind of stuff. Um, we could just go back to being a spirit spammer but use lots of offensive spirits. Vampirism being a new thing in our arsenal so we could combo it together with painful bond and you guys would see big damage there. The fear with that is if anyone else in the team is doing it we're duds. Uh, then there's also hybrid minion spammer. We could do a bit of both. Or we could be a defensive spirit spammer where we're running shelter and union and restoration and some of the rarer ones like Earthbind and, and stuff like that, you know. 
and maybe combo with Wanderlust if we can cap it. So th those are the build ideas. I bet by the time I've gone on this whole spiel, you guys already voted. But to those of you a bit late to the party, there you go. You got all the information. Let's see what you want to say. And while waiting for the results to come in a little bit longer, let's see uh, what we've got going on with the primary quest here. And uh, we'll see. Maybe this, this version of, of voting will go a little bit better. Which one am I most excited about? Uh, I, all of them excite me, I think. The one I'm least excited about is probably Offensive Spirit Spammer, just because I'm pretty sure other... Look at all the slash writs and things we've got around. I'm pretty sure other people want to play that stuff, and they will play that stuff if I don't, so... And we've already seen a lot of Spirit Spamming, so that's probably the one at, at the bottom of the row, but we haven't seen it in its true strength or efficacy, so I'm, I'm even that, I'm still excited about it. It's just at the bottom of the list. Adept Kai. Now that you have become Wayno Su, you can seek the advice and assistance of Kanta's ancient heroes. Travel to the Tanakai Temple and speak with the spirits who reside there. Okay, I will go to the Tanakai Temple. We get a skill point for this. We're very close to level 20 now. Um, and we're off into the Zhangwang Skyway, which I've talked about at great length in the recent streams. It's a, uh, le um, a level on top of a level. The Undercity we were in before, we now get to go above it. I am Senji. I serve the Oracle of the Mists by finding individuals with the proper occupation based on their abilities. Do you wish... <laughs> Do you wish to broaden your horizons and see if another path is right for you? For a one-time thing of 500 gold, I can teach you a new secondary profession. I can also return you to a previous secondary profession free of charge. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, yeah, and you get all the happy little icons here. Oh, speaking of icons, and I seem rare bits of the UI here. Speaking of this, I was looking in my old, like, um, Art of Guild Wars 2 book. Go, go, go back to the making of Guild Wars 2. And it's got this beautiful map of Tyria in there with these luxurious, like, icons that represent, like, the Black Citadel and the Flame Citadel and ore and all these lovely, lovely uh, things that you don't get anywhere in game. It's a map that... You guys know me, I like compiling all the different fantasy maps that have appeared throughout this franchise's history. And I never showed that on my video production of it before. So to any of you big nerds out there who are a bit bored right now, go get your Making of Guild Wars 2 book from your collector's edition and look through it. It's really, really gorgeous. Okay. Uh, so let's see what we got here. Results. Okay, so not many votes really on this compared to other ones. Uh, but it looks like like it lightning nuker is at the top, I guess, which is this build, uh, but different. So let's go back to our skills and try and just improve this a bit, shall we? And let's see what we don't. That's what the people voted on. I, I, maybe I made a mistake by writing nuker, and you guys think, oh my god, big damage. It doesn't mean it's the highest DPS thing, nor does it mean the most interesting Guild Wars one content to watch. It has to be high DPS, but there you go. I guess it's what people want. So we got all the channeling. Maybe these skills didn't update, actually. Let's see communing. Because I'm I'm at liberty to change the uh, attribute spread now, however the hell I like. So let's see. If we just cap out these two and supplement with spawning power, since we're not weapon or spirit bound. Let's see. Let's pick up a new signet of capture. And let's do that. Um, right, and I'm not sure how much Necro stuff we'll get a look in here. I will keep Necrosis because it has been a bit of a powerhouse for us. Uh, so let's do that. Now, what else have we got? Um, sort by type. Item spells. I mean, Cruel Was Dao Shen is the thing for this playstyle. 10% armor pen on all of our stuff. I mean, it's just a bit fiddly because you lose energy from having it. Lively was Naomi is cool. I have a really cool story of one of the first times I saw this. I think it was my brother using it. I'm, I'm, and I might be misremembering this. Someone out there might be like, ah, WP, that's not how the mechanics work. You're lying. In which case, my memory is off. But I, I swear to God, I have a very real memory of this skill being used. I think it was my brother. Maybe it was me at this point. I, I don't know. But it was um, uh, at Arborstone, and the whole party wiped. Everyone died. Eight-man wipe uh, to, like, some of the falling ceiling and stuff. And it was a bit of a nightmare, to be honest. But, as I recall, it was my brother holding Lively was Naomi. He was playing a ritualist. He was holding this. And this skill is, 
When you drop the ashes, all party members in the area are resurrected with very low health and no energy, but they are all resurrected. And when you die, you drop what you're holding. And as I recall, it was a full eight-man wipe, and that should kick you. But as he died, he dropped the ashes, thus reviving people and uh, saving the day. That was one of my. That was a very prominent memory I have. It might be that that doesn't actually work, but that's rattling around in my brain somehow. Yeah, it's got to be okay. So we will maintain. Cruel was Dao Shen. Ancestor's Rage is high damage, but a bit annoying to use because you have to go into melee. But it combos well with the on-drop effect of Crawler's Dalshan, so maybe we can continue using it. I don't know. Um, what else is he selling? I mean, I filtered the vendor list here, which, to be honest, was probably a bit silly. Uh, restoration, we're not going to find anything good. Um... Dulled weapon isn't going to be interesting. Binding chains isn't going to be interesting from a, a damage perspective, which is what we've been trying, right? I don't know, guys. I, I don't know what else I could do. With the current selection, it doesn't feel like there's much opportunity here. Spawning power, we have everything. Um, let's put Ancestor's Rage back. It's just the damage isn't that high. Maybe we can get some runes to bump the damage again, but they're not scaling that heavily. Damage, uh, lightning damage, if I'm an earshot, they get blinded. We could try destruction, but with, how, with the pace that the party's going to be moving through, we're just going to walk out of range of destruction. It's not, it's not going to be as valuable as you think it is. The channeled strike combo is good. I like that. This is like our main hit. Really, that will hit harder than necros necrosis if they're not lightning resistant. It will. Um, we could bring spirit rift back, maybe. I mean, it's a lot of damage and cracked armor. Hit uh, yeah, let's try this. Okay, spirit rift applies cracked armor, which will further reduce their resistance to subsequent hits. So if we can get a spirit rift first. Then that's cracked armor giving us armor pen. That's the ashes giving us armor pen. And then that's the big slams afterwards. So it's in theory pretty good. Spirit burn I'll drop because it's not an interesting enough packet of damage. Essence strike I'll keep. And I'll just try and be better at the energy management aspect of it. And that that's going to be the build, guys. With our elite that we'll pick up. I mean... Explosive growth. Maybe we could try this. Maybe it could be. No, that's a hybrid build though. If we wanted to do a spirit, uh, that that would, that would be different. I'm gonna run ruptured soul. Just to rupture the soul of other people's spirits. Like no no lie, I'm actually gonna do that. We could do a hybrid build eventually. A hybrid spirit spam lightning striker that uses doom. And explosive growth. So we nuke people as we spawn and we doom and we, we do all of that stuff. That's an interesting idea. But it's not what you voted on here. So we won't use that just yet. Spirit's gift on minion mounts of the hybrid is cool as well. But you guys didn't vote on that either. Alright, let's try this. I guess. That's as good as I can do with the current selection, guys. I'm afraid. I mean, we kind of knew what our offerings were from the previous mission. Yeah, that's basically a Shatter Ritualist. That's a good point. Yeah, that is essentially a Shatter Ritualist. That's very strange, isn't it? How different friggin' Shatters went before. Because a Shatter Guild Wars 1 build is all about hex removal and hex management and stuff. Anyway, out we go. Zhang Rang Skyway. I hope everybody's ready. Let's get going. In before no one else has any spirits? Yeah, that would kind of suck, but hey. Um, now... We want to be on the look. We can get Ritualist of Grenth here, which is nice. We want to be on the lookout for... Uh, this elite skill. I'm not sure where it spawns or anything, so we'll just have to hope that we see it. I'm really sorry to bother you, but please, I could really use some help. I lost my wife to the plague, and the Ministry burned down our house during the quarantine. Now, my children and I have nowhere to go. 
The guards will not let us into the refugee camp without a shelter pass, but unfortunately, in the mad rush to leave our home, I forgot our pass. When I return to get it, the house is already engulfed in flames. Please, can you procure a shelter pass for me and my children? I was told that guardsman Pong Tu here in Zhangwang Skyway might have a few left to hand out for the children. Pong Tu's right here immediately. Uh, there's a beautiful area near here with some rare canther mobs, by the way, in the north. Some scavengers in kind of a broken, burned down area that NPC's talking about. My captain stationed me here at the camp to help keep order. Ironically, it's become my home. Like most of the refugees here, I lost my family and my home to the plague. I know what these people are going through, and it pains me to deny them entrance, but I have my orders. So the pass is, this isn't bureaucracy gone mad. This is, okay, you've got to make sure infected people don't get into the safe zone. If you're looking for a shelter pass, I can't help you. My orders are to let no one through without one. If you're in dire straits, I suggest you look for Imperial Guardsman Ting Zhou. He is currently combining the, uh, sorry, combing the sewers for survivors, giving out passes to those in need. So that's in the Shenzhen Tunnels, which is in the next map, which is where the primary quest wants us to go as well. They say don't go too far up. The boss is very easy to aggro. I guess I'll follow them. I'll, I'll listen to them. I'm, I'm no expert these days. I am but a mere adept. Uh, initiate, sorry. Acolyte. We should delete builds that win the straw poll so future streams are guaranteed to have different ones. That's an interesting idea. Um, maybe. Oh, is this literally the guy? Okay. All right, here we go. So, Spirit Rift got interrupted. Great. T -way. Not sure who or how. We're kind of getting wrecked here. Do we not have any healing anymore going on? Let's head back up. Let's summon our thing as well. Oh, God. No, 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 no. I messed this up. Oh, I got interrupted again. What am I getting? I'm Signet of disru Disruption. That's annoying. So, hold on. Rupture Soul is... Yeah, it's point blank. So, I, I don't expect to be able to utilize this that much because we're reliant on other people summoning nearby. So there you go. Cracked armor. 112. 112. Straight back in again. It's pretty good. Energy management from Essence Strike. Yeah. Okay, cool. Here we go. Tranquil was Tanisen. Hold Tanisen's ashes for up to six seconds. While we hold them, we have extra armor and cannot be interrupted, which is super useful, actually, considering he's a guy that was in a packet that was interrupting us. Very nice. Uh, we can maybe use that later. Uh, what I'm going to do is go straight back into the instance, though, and um, buy a new slot, a new signet, because if Wanderlust is here en route, I want to pick that up as well. A uh, bit annoying, maybe. Sorry to people who uh, get a bit frustrated by that, but yeah, we'll do that. You guys want me to... Uh... <laughs> Pick up the red die. I, I don't really think that's that important. Let's quickly nip over. You know what this voting reminds me of? It reminds me of draft builds in MTG, except the random boosters are instead of chat voting. I have no experience with MTG, so I'm not sure really how that uh, works out. But I mean, yeah, I, I'm a bit dismayed that the word nuke seems to have affected people's sensibilities there so heavily. I, I guess I'm making a mistake believing the people in the straw polls are watching multiple streams. And that's what's kind of shitty about Twitch. People come and go so quickly. You kind of have to always assume that. But I mean, look, I'm not mad. I wouldn't have put it on there if I didn't want to play a line in Nuka. Right. So we got that. Hopefully everybody got their new skill. And I didn't just interrupt people mid-purchase. Um, let's cross over. What's really beautiful about this bridge we can look at here, if you actually look down, I think you can see real hints as to the Undercity underneath, uh, which is really cool. Yeah, we do the boss again. I know, I know. It kind of sucks. I got rid of our elite, but we already have an item skill, and i got to get used to this. Oh, and I, we didn't go back to the Reaper. Whatever. You can only get Wanderlust once you get into the Zinku Corridor. It leads to Tanakai Temple. Yeah, it's the next map, right? Here you go, Tranquil's Tanacene. Spirit Rift. Wait for it to proc. There it is. Channeled Strike. Necrosis. Essence Strike. That was pretty good. That felt good. I'm not sad about that. That was nice, guys. We could catch a regular skill from him now as well. And here we would have done pretty well also, except that he cast Power Return on us. So those Mesmers are using special factions. Uh, Mesmer... Holding items is horrible because it runs me into melee all the time and I don't want to be. 
Oh, that was good. Look, look, look. It's working. Yeah, Spirit Rift with the cracked armor proccing the Necrosis. It all works, actually. This is good. Spirit Rift was the big difference. It's a shame we don't get a thematically tied Elite just yet. Um, we'll just work our way through. Let's pick this item back up here as well. That's a nice combo as well because we can cast Cruel with Dao Shen while waiting for the Rift to blow up. Uh, here I need to Essence Strike. Get a bit of that. Necrosis we can do before the cracked armor lands because it's typeless and the cracked armor doesn't it doesn't care about cracked armor. So whether we go skill two or skill three first is like based on whether the rift is hit yet or not. If I got into MTG, I'd never leave. Well, listen, in some ways I'm a very stingy person. I don't really have a lifestyle or anything that can afford anything else. So as far as the one thing I've always consistently heard about MTG yet, yeah, look, look down, that is actually the map down there. I'm not joking. You see that? That fuzz there? That is a portal. Or at least visually it's a portal. I don't know whether it's hooked up to actually work with one. But one of the things that always excited me, they don't populate with mobs or anything. But uh, yeah, one thing I've always consistently heard about MTG is that it's expensive as dick. So, I don't know, man. I, uh, I'd like to think it wouldn't hook me and abuse me. Uh, what else do I know about MTG? Well, um, that the Black Lotus is the most honorable card in the game. Uh, what else do I know? I don't know. That it's never had a convincing video game uh, adaptation because of UX issues primarily. And how Blizzard penetrated that market so well with Hearthstone is it what it, it did, what the MTG guys were never intelligent enough to figure out how to do. Or maybe they just didn't want to cannibalize their own audience, and that's perfectly fair to say. It might have channeled strike too early. No, I didn't. Look at that. That's really nice. It flows perfectly. Spear rift into channeled strike. Flows per the cast time, the two second cast time is enough to, to blow it up. MTG is mostly only fun if you play with friends, playing meta decks of tournaments. The other thing I heard, where did I hear this? Maybe it was someone in one of my stream chats. Or maybe it was something completely unrelated to me or with potatoes or anything like that. But I heard that people, one of the things that people enjoy about, uh, like, Gamescom and stuff. I'm pretty sure it was on a wooden potatoes stream chat. Is, um, that feels good. Come on, somebody condi or hex it, damn it. Shit, I shouldn't expect that. Uh, is the, like, if you play MTG, it's just this brilliant thing to have in common with other people. And... You could always just find a quiet corner to just play MTG. Like, uh, you know, it's this easy thing you can kind of carry with you. And because it's such an, a ubiquitous pastime for nerds, it's kind of, you know, it's a, a touchstone, if you will, for communicating and breaking the ice and just having fun and stuff, you know. And I kind of respect that. Oh, that Necrosis got council cast because I think he might have cleansed the Hex. Or we just had a horrible timing there. This is going so smoothly, guys. Just random ad hoc. I don't know whether it's because someone I'm playing with every single stream is really smart and, like, on the ball about what the hell I'm doing and making sure that they've got heals and stuff. But I'm putting zero thought or intelligence into, co into comp craft here at all. I'm literally just grabbing whoever. We haven't bothered about primary monks or anything purely through secondaries. People have filled in and it's amazing that Guild Wars got to this point. Maybe it's just power creep and because we're only in normal mode and stuff. But I remember so many hours sitting around waiting for monks and even the most mundane anodyne content. And here we are just plowing through. It's cool. It just shows how open, you know, there were all, all this design went into Guild Wars 2 about stopping people having to wait around to play it, have fun and all that stuff. And, you know, Guild Wars 1 wasn't some hard shelled monstrosity in that regard. It's pretty fine. You know, it's pretty open, pretty comfy. We burn corpses of the deceased to prevent sickness from spreading. Ordinarily, it's simple operation. Unpleasant, but simple. The bodies are left at Buck Deck Byway and we burn them at the pyre. Lately, though, there's been a, thra a rash of body thefts, and I'm worried this could lead to an epidemic. Head over to the Buck Dick Byway. Burn those corpses there. If there are any missing, find out who have taken them and where they've gone. Safety. Wow, well, that's a creepy, creepy, creepy quest as well, isn't it? Oh, check it out. Melandry's Watcher. We haven't seen one of these yet. Does this do anything for us as a Rick? Because spirits, maybe? 20 armor against elemental damage. That everyone can use. Plus 50 maximum health? Fine. It's a nice little extra bit. 
Corpse Stealers sounds like Frankenstein. I, I don't remember how that quest goes or the conclusion to it. I would suspect it's got something to do with the armed far, though, and, um... Oh, yeah, the little lost bear. Did we do that? No, we didn't in the end. Luxury goods. Those are the mirrors that we were supposed to give out. Let's just keep heading to Tanaka, I guess. Um... I forgot what I said. Yeah, it's probably, I would suspect it's like Amphar or something in their, their research into the plagues and, I don't know, ransoms and threatening people. If you take Ranger of Melandru at the Melandru's Watcher, you also get plus one for expertise, which reduces energy costs. That's true, Doc. You impress me sometimes very much. Yeah, that's a good point. If you buff all your Ranger attributes, even if you're not a Ranger, primary or secondary, their primary attribute is uh, is expertise, so it would reduce the ca the casting cost of some of our skills. The uh, like ancestors' rage, N yeah, ancestors' rage is a skill. Uh, I guess that means for uh, Ellie as well, you could pick up energy storage. Our attacks have further armor pen. Strength doesn't mean anything for us, I don't think. Or because this isn't a spell. Maybe strength does buff Ancestor's Rage. It's a weird interaction I haven't thought of. Uh, yeah, I've never seen such a good use of uh, Feels Good Man. Looks like a wise old, like, Guild Wars 1, uh, you know, sage. Hey, people. Thanks for doing a unique and original stream, WP. Love hearing you discuss with no filter. Thanks very much, man. Um... Yeah, there is a bit of a filter to me on, on YouTube. I, I actually think about what I want to say before I say it. You hear a lot of stuff that I just waffle and ramble out in streams that about two hours later I very much disagree with. You know, the, the, the filter I think is important on YouTube. Very important. Uh, you know, you'll hear me rant endlessly about things on Twitch that I've not really made up my mind if I really try and dissociate myself from my feelings as to whether I know what I'm talking about. And you just won't hear me talk about it on YouTube because... I gotta, you know, maintain some level of caution there. Uh, but yeah, it's it's nice to have an outlet with no filter as well, which I guess is what Twitch has become in a, in a, in a big way. This will be good. Oh no, wait. man! I want tankier mobs right now. I really want tankier mobs. I, I really, really, this build has suddenly dawned on me that I really like it. <laughs> My end of stream guilt makes you try. Yeah, basically that's what that is. When I have end of stream guilt, that's what that is. That's oh god, man, you didn't prepare for these conversations. Actually, here's the thing that scared the crap out of me, and I was gonna tell you about. Like, here's the thing, because you never know what's watching. I'm not arrogant enough to believe anyone of import gives a crap about anything I ever say, and why they would put up with the crap I talk about as well. I have no idea. Like, honestly, no idea. But sometimes a thing will happen. Check this out. I ha I'll anonymize the person's name who messaged me. But I literally saw on my Twitch messages, which I don't look at often, okay? I have a Twitch message from one of the streams last weekend. We were talking about how an intern did all of the dialogue at the Dermond Priory Live. This is really important what I'm saying right now. So listen up, guys. I, talk I gave her the anecdote and a story. It's not the first time I've given this story. But uh, I gave an anecdote very recently about how an intern at ArenaNet wrote all those law books on season two. And I had it in my head that that intern had messaged me at some point and they'd said they don't work at ArenaNet anymore. And, uh, and I, I'd been talking about how I'd lost, you know, because of that, I'd been a bit disappointed because it was like, oh, this was one of the coolest things and maybe we won't get that weight of law bombed in again because the person behind it wasn't there anymore, you know? I, and I, I talked openly about that. No filter, just, you know, that was my memory of the event. I, took, I gave that anecdote about a week ago. I have a message from someone here on Twitch. Obviously, there's no way of verifying it. Saying, hey, yeah, I was an intern at ArenaNet and I wrote all the books in the library. I'm still here at the company. I also created an event in Kessex Hills and I also named the Black Lion Trading Company. So to you, person, who I'm keeping anonymous here, I don't know whether someone's having me on there, but there you go. So I was wrong, they're still there, and that scares the crap out of me, because one, I'm wrong in, in my memory of that anecdote. Two, that person is like active enough to hear some random nonsense I talk about on one of these streams, and that scares the living shit out of me. Uh, but yeah, there you go. Um, and I responded to them. I, they might not have seen it yet. So, uh, 
richness of friends. Cool. Uh, so yeah, there you go, guys. I was wrong. That intern is still there, and we can all be very happy. The, the big ticket news is, hey, be excited. You know, it's not like they've lost uh, the 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 minds and enthusiasm and 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 whatnot that was responsible for such a wonderful season two instance. Um, yeah, it does seem that they a lot of interns do good. I remember when Dry Top came out. I think it was they added like that golden chicken or something that you you find in a hidden achievement. And on one of the guild streams, they talked about how it was there because an intern came to do some art for ArenaNet and they went like crazy big dick on the art for just random birds or something. Like super intricate, super high res, countless hours of, you know, desperate work on these, these essentially inconsequential ambient creatures. And some designers higher up the chain had seen all this effort that had gone into it and felt like it was a grim shame that they hadn't you know, they didn't have better representation in the game, so then they had a more prominent role in, in Dry Top or something. I remember little stories like that, and it just makes me think about these wide-eyed, excitable devs that come on in in their early days, and, you know, they do all this crazy stuff, and, you know, the reality is MMOs are so big, uh, it must weather your soul a little bit to realize, you know, any one tiny bit. There are, there are very select few nerds out there who will really appreciate that tiny little thing most people, it, it will just get lost in the soup of the rest of the MMO. You cannot enter Tanakai Temple. Only the Emperor and those of noble blood can enter this holy place. Since you obviously are not royalty, I suggest you find someone who is. Otherwise, you can give up any ideas you have of entering the temple. These people are dicks to us. Don't you know me? Mind you, we're not really a great hero yet. We kind of are. So, you are... T I like it. We're just another soul in this large city. Lost in the city. So you're telling me you're friends with the Emperor's half-brother, Master Toga? Pff, sure you are. And I am the Emperor himself. As I've said before, no one but those of Imperial blood may enter. Now, get out of my face. He's out of there. All right. So we're going to go find these people and uh, crush this man's face into the poo by revealing that, indeed, we were not lying. What's the most recent art thing I've disagreed with myself on? Because I've ranted about it's been pretty consistent since the No Skills Challenge. That's an amazing question, man. It's quite often just little things. Um, where I just appreciate that there is another side and value to a perspective that I've just not done justice to. It, it, it's quite often I'm I, 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 I'm often based in the main thrust of whatever I'm talking about, but it's that I've been unrealistically narrow-minded about something, and I appreciate like there's a lot of value in doing something another way, or you know that that I just I, and and I feel bad that I don't air that that side of the story, and quite often it's a set self-interested thing as well because you know to a greater or lesser extent I am trying to convince people of my way of thinking on a stream in a weird way i know that sounds incredibly weird to say but you know if you're if you're talking passionately about, about a topic and you feel like an outsider with regard to it that there's a part of rhetoric involved with that uh, i have no idea where everyone is by the way and our quest tells us to come here uh, i i think i remember the way we go um and quite often it's self-interested because i'm like oh i should have talked about in more detail the other side of the coin because to do that is to show that the other side of the coin has actually been considered and if you have truly considered the other side of the coin and you've expressed its strongest points and you still come to the same conclusion then you know your sound and your whole argument is more convincing uh, and quite often after a stream I just realize about myself I'm not doing that well enough not enough to convince myself and certainly not other people there is a very real thing I'm very acutely aware of. And it's not that I don't appreciate you guys. And it's not that I don't like having a little echo chamber. But there's a very real thing where basically people will have a much higher propensity to agree with me on this stream. And just because I get a lot of nodding on a Twitch stream chat doesn't actually mean that I've convinced who needs to be convinced on the off chance that they might eventually see something I produce. And you've got to be very, 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 very aggressive about that. M my entire life, really. Or as long as I'm doing this job, I have to... I can't just be like... Oh, a criteria overhaul. Yeah, everybody's agreeing in chat. Woo! And then just assume I've got a big dick. You know, I have to accept. Maybe I don't. Maybe other people have bigger ones and they've got reasons they're bigger. Um, <laughs> I've got to stop. I've got to stop with that as well. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, so I, don't, I can't think of a very specific little thing, but maybe that's an insight.
How would I describe myself as a friend? And how much do I prioritize if I do? I'm a terrible friend, man. I've talked about that on the last streams. You must know that. You've seen enough. I'm an awful friend. I'm not, I'm not empathetic. I'm not considerate of enough other people. I don't... I, I'm, I'm not, not a good friend. I don't seem to appreciate companionship as most other as much as most other people do. Uh, yeah, but hey, I'm 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 a fortunate man in many ways. All right, let's take these out and not get too far ahead of ourselves. It is a defense mission of defending over here. This is one of the more pretty areas of the sewer as well, by the way, uh, or the city in general. I love just how big and open it feels here. This is where they can really play with perspective. When you get these kinds of scales. It's kind of amazing to think of people living all the way back up in there, you know. It just feels so industrial and just awesome. Here we go, let's do our combo. This isn't the full combo because we didn't have the weapon. Damn, that spirit transfer heal. He's down anyway. I can't remember. Did we get poison for wading into the the uh, the muck? I do remember you being a bad friend to Matt a lot of time. Well, no, I've talked a lot about that on the stream. I've, you know, Matt, Matt, Matt has wrestled with that for years. But, uh, you know, I'm generally not that sociable. You think it's others also can't really refute unless they do as much research, so it's a lot easier to agree? Uh, yeah, I mean, whatever the reason is, uh, you know, argumentum ad populum is, 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 a, is a scary thing that you shouldn't fall into, you know? Um, and it's, it's a struggle to deal with on the internet when upvotes are king and all that kind of stuff now. But yeah, just because just cause I see a lot of people in my little circle nodding, uh, it doesn't mean that outside the house there's not an army looking in angrily, you know? Uh, I don't know. I just, uh, you just got to convince yourself. And I don't think I'm very special in that, by the way. I don't think that's, uh, you know, li literally every single opinion you have, you should make it a job to convince yourself of it. Well, I, I really want to think of an actual good example, because they, they happen like every stream. Like, literally every stream, there'll be something I say, and later I'll be like, ah, is that really true? Like, every stream, literally. There will have been something even today, probably. Yeah, like, um, like the law and stuff here. I was, I was waffling out the, I don't really know how much I enjoy the law here. But even as I was saying it, I was thinking, ah, man, maybe I do really like the law. Maybe this is good. Maybe it is okay that it's uh, super alien and bizarre. Maybe maybe I do want to see the sequel go into it. You know, literally, as I was saying it, I was thinking, do I fully agree with my initial gut instinct when I started this stream? And I don't know whether I do. That's and it's minor enough that, I mean, honestly, it's not worth talking about. Or saying, oh, guys, I'm sorry. Sometimes it, it happens in the other direction as well. You remember we did a stream talking about... Um, how random people will say, oh, FF14's raids are better than Guild Wars is, but Guild Wars is better than WoW's, and this is better. And they'll base it n largely on the presumption that a difficult raid is a good raid, and the way we judge how difficult it is, is how long it takes the best of the best to clear it. That's all over all MMO communities. Here's, here's the answer to whether a raid is good or not, apparently, guys. If it takes ages to clear by the best players, if it takes ages to clear, it's quality content. And I, I, talk, I talked about that on a stream and we broke it down and I basically pointed out this is, this is complete bullshit. Everything about the game and how it's structured refines its accessibility. And not just gear treadmills, but a ton of other things in terms of traveling to it, in terms of patch times, in terms of downtime, in terms of player count, in terms of you know how you socialize with people to get that amount of player count and how refined LFGs are and all that crap right like there's a whole world of things and uh i did a i did a stream about that we talked about that we broke that down and we basically came, i put forth the idea that it's completely arbitrary and every time i see it on the on on the internet that oh this is how we judge the value of raids it annoys me uh i went after that stream and sometimes it happens in the reverse direction here's another really important point that i never listed out i never trotted out but think about this too respawn timers right it's got nothing to do with gear treadmills but is Guild, are Guild Wars 2's raids worse or easy, uh, easier, sorry, or, you know, uh, the actual quality of the content, is that deformed just because Guild Wars 2 allows us to slash GG and instantly resets us right next to the boss in most situations with all our cooldowns all back. There's no such energy mechanic. There's no 
uh, death penalty. There's no armor repairs we have to worry about. All our cooldowns are back. All 10 of us are there, and we go straight back in. And the game is built... It's Super Meat Boy. It's, ra it's where raids meet MMOs. Uh, it's where Super Meat Boy meets MMOs. That's Guild Wars 2 raiding. And as a result, our best players can clear the content in, a, in, in you know, a matter of hours in the first day as opposed to an arbitrary duration of two weeks. Are you really telling me that just because these atmospheres are different, FF14s are better? Like, it's just, come on, this is kiddie hour. And anyway, I, th I, I found myself after the stream thinking, oh, I really should, I should have mentioned the respawn thing. That's a good thing. You know, it's just little shit like that. Which on YouTube, you get to sit down and script things out and think about what you're going to say before you say it. So the format is just it's wonderful for a person like me because uh, you can do a proper uh, a proper discussion. Right, anyway. So everyone bored half to death. We're at Tanakai Temple. We should get a cutscene here. And maybe another flashback. Ooh. Basically the guy is like, oh, you are royal, cool. I knew you would come. Did you? You're not the type to give up on a grudge. You're right. What is it you want? Want? From you? Just a little revenge. Last time we met, I beat you, Shiro. I will beat you again! It's different this time. This time, I'm facing you. You can't kill me, Shiro. I'm already dead! I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to force you to be my ally, to fight by my side. You'll have to catch me first. You coward. Last time you stabbed me in the back. This time you run. I shall reserve for you a special torture. One for the weak and the honorless. More top quality right there. So yeah, uh, Vizu having killed him before, and now he pierced, so we gotta, you know, uh, deal with this as they fight in undeath. Kind of interesting. That route was pretty cool. Come. The spirit of Vizu resides in this hall. It was her blade strike that crippled Shiro 200 years ago and eventually led to his death. If anyone can tell us how to defeat him, it will be her. Follow me. Keep up if you can. Master Togo is faster than he looks. Bitch, I'm gonna assume you were saying that to some of the other Tyrian people. I've been training with Master Togo, alright? I know how fast he is, and I can keep up and then some, alright? I am Poopa. Uh, look, what is this in chat? A Jules. Remember when that guy on Reddit said something like, You don't need to be informed to have an opinion. After you told us about that on a stream, I went and argued with him, and he tried to prove that I don't live up to that ideal. So he searched through my entire Reddit history to try and find something that was not a well-considered opinion. And eventually he deleted a bunch of his comments because he was a stupid asshole. What? Dude, don't go like internet warrioring, especially not on my behalf. That's amazing though. Hold on, I don't know what you're talking about though. I remember on a stream I gave an, uh, when the Jessica Price stuff was going on, I remember being very dismayed because I saw a tweet it wasn't and I and I didn't mention anything beyond the fact it was a tweet and it was someone who was expressing very and I never even mentioned what the opinions were it was someone on a tweet expressing extremely strong opinions and then a third person had responded to them saying well you may uh, you might be missing a bit part of the puzzle x y or z and that person responded saying 
oh, I don't care about those extra facts. This is wrong. I already know how I feel. Uh, and it, they, they basically, it was a tweet that encapsulated. This person was like, my opinion is now my opinion. I, I don't care about the other facts. I don't need to look up more. I don't need any context. I don't need your further clarifications and elaborations. My gut reaction, which I got from this headline, that's it, man. I've got that now, and I don't need to look any further. I I don't need... How dare you try... And, like, it, I don't know where what cultures where this comes from, but there's like there's some people are very scared of having their mind changed. They get offended by the thought. And it's like, no, 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 my mind's made up. You're not allowed to change that now. Context doesn't... No, no, no. It was basically a tweet where someone was just blatantly saying, no, I'm, I'm done now. I've got my opinion. I don't need further information. I've got it. And I, 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 I'd read that tweet. I'd absorbed it. And it really, really... I, I, it didn't sit well with me and it frustrated me to realize that that, that that I'm not like making it up and I'm not like uh, exaggerating the situation it was a very real splash of cold water like these are actual adults and humans this is the world and that's a scary moment you know a little moment where you grow up a little bit more and you realize this is why some things are really messed up and uh, anyway that I spewed that out I spat that on a stream but that was nothing to do with reddit so I like the idea that you went an internet warrior some random guy on Reddit in a completely different circumstance. Uh, actually, I don't like the idea you internet warrior. Don't do that, please. Anyway. Right. Do we want to change our build? I want to play this again. I'm going to play this again on this instance. I'm going to do it. You appreciate Guild Wars 1 for what it is, but Guild Wars 2 came a long way. Absolutely. Hell yeah. <laughs> oh, you got 100 blades, dude. That's awesome, Nike. That's so cool, dude. That's a great emote. Look at this. See, the answer is to steal Guild Wars 1 icons and just have them as your emotes on Twitch. That'll get you all the subs, all right? Nike's gone with an elite there as well. No, I, you're never going to... If your whole mindset is to fight, oh, i got to tackle this person into my... It's not going to happen, like... I, I, I don't know. What's that quote? Society develops when old men die. Something like that. And it's kind of... Uh, I can't remember. Where. That's not the quote. It's some pithy thing that basically encapsulates that idea. Some people... Um, some things, they kind of have to be taught. Uh, there's a level of open-mindedness and things that I'm quite cynical that I think after a certain age, if your entire outlet is geared and oriented around something like that, you're better educating the young than you are fighting the old. It's sort of my feeling on it, but I don't know. I could be wrong on that. There you go. There's a statement. There's a statement that I just waffled out, and I've got no idea what I'm talking about. I'm out of my depth. What am I doing? Bit of stream guilt. There you go. Beyond these gates reside the spirits of Canther's greatest heroes. They're in great peril right now. Master Togo went on ahead and is awaiting you. Hurry. Level 20. Hell yeah. Leveled up, baby. <laughs> Uh, let's drop the spawning power by one so that we can up the communing by one. And now we're perfect spread. The truth is, it's all channeling anyway. Never mind then. We don't have any communing skills on this setup. <laughs> any. So here, we'll, uh, we'll do it this way. We'll restoration up a little bit just for the hell of it, I guess. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. But, uh, yeah, with the spawning power up, this means our item spell will last ages. I think. Or it's only weapon spells that last longer. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's a bit too cynical for my taste to think that people can never change. It's a little bit too cynical for my taste. I like the thought that you it's never too late. I like the thought that you can get anyone to come around on anything. But maybe that's a bit naive. I don't know. Pff, Jesus Christ. What a sheltered, pretty, prissy little life I've had. A mid-twenties man playing video games, yeah. i got the life experience that qualifies me to talk about this. It's okay, because I'm on the internet and people will listen. Woohoo! That's the beauty of the 21st century, bitches. Let's do it. All right, uh, we got a new outpost. Uh, for centuries, Tanakai Temple has housed the souls of Canthus' most revered heroes. The bravest and most accomplished member of each profession rests here, rendered by, uh, sorry, tended, uh, rendered, tended by priests of the Sai Ling Order. Ornate statues lie in the Great Hall, each a stunning likeness of the hero it represents. These magnificent effigies, sculpted by Kurzic artisans, are enchanted with protective magic that guards this temple and its inhabitants from harm. Now listen, 
I love that they've got a bit of asymmetry here. They're not... If this was Guild Wars 2, I will... I promise you, core Guild Wars 2 at least, you see how they mentioned the Kurzix here? It absolutely, a thousand percent, would have been over-designed, and they they would have shoehorned something in about the Luxons here as well. Because there has to be symmetry. Oh, 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 you can't do a thing about the Kurzix. Got it, all choices equal. It has to be a bit of Luxon stuff. And you see that symmetry all the time. It cripples the world building and the reality of, of Guild Wars 2. Guild Wars 1, they don't care. Kurzix did these statues. Who cares about Luxons? They, they had nothing to do with it. And it feels real. It's beautiful. Uh, Guild Wars 2 is not so bad with it these days. Um, but at launch, it certainly was. Uh, but you're about to see some of the worst, one of the worst design missions in all of the original game, in my opinion, here. And I mean truly, it's bad, and uh, you'll see why uh, when we enter. Uh, Umod is better, Fluganti. Umod. Umod is the basically newer version of Text Mod. It can swap the textures on the fly. You can skin and unskin as you're going. It's much less limited. And it's the more moddable one. It's the open source one. It's what I hope someone picks up the torch in Guild Wars 2 one day, hopefully. Togo must survive. Menlo must survive. We have to free eight souls and we are on a time limit. So, Brother Menlo, this part, this is a part of Cantha that I wish I'd explored while I was here in my early years. Come, let us find Vizu. There is no more time to waste. There you go. All right. Um... We do not have much time before Vizu is bound. Perhaps if we free the other spirits, they can lend their strength to Vizu. So we've seen how Shiro kind of accrues afflicted and stuff right now. Well, here we can see what he does to souls. He binds them into physical armor. That is a Shuriken. That's what he does, and he's done it to many of the heroes here. Now, we're on quite a tight time limit, but they also pair this with a lot of lore and world building and backstory and reading, and it's just awful because <laughs> you can't ever read in peace any of it. Now, one thing about the actual mechanics in terms of playing, uh, what you can do is pull most of these bosses separate to their pulls. So, we will try and do that. Here, I'm already out of energy. Christ. We don't have any shrines here and extra perks, so that's a bit of a shame. But, starting off with Bound Kinta. I'm going to drop this. No, I'm not. I don't want to drop it. Let's just go straight into the energy management here. And Ancestor's Rage Necrosis. Beautiful. Now this Ritualist is going to try and res. I just need to keep summoning Essence, Essence Strike and hoping that there's Spirits in Earshot from my allies, which I'm assuming there will be. But yeah, I will try and race through the lore while everybody else goes ahead. Let's learn about Kinta. You can also come back here after the mission for what it's worth, but that doesn't absolve it of its initial impression it gives you that you need to read it first time through. And you know, that conflict, just that conflict of going for the Master's Reward and doing stuff fast is going to frustrate players from a co-op perspective. 300 years ago when the thriving Canton, and these are all beautiful parables here, uh, the thriving Canton port of Din Fang was invaded by the people then known only as Nithlen or pirates. The Canton army sent a small force stationed at nearby Fort Fu to put down what they saw as nothing more than a pack of rabid dogs. When young Kinta arrived, sorry Kita arrived with her troops, she discovered that an organized invasion was underway, led by the Nithen general Apollonia several uh, sorry severely outnumbered and outgunned the mesmer cleared a, uh, created a cloud of illusion that made her squadron appear to double in size and then redouble then redouble again until her force appeared a great army as she ordered the charge the Nithen scattered in terror many running into the sea and drowning themselves in the midst of the chaos, Kita found Apollonia, a warrior, and the two fought until both fell down dead on the battlefield. Din Fang was ultimately saved, and Kita inducted into Tanakai Temple. By the way, many of these characters, Kita, have skills named after them that players can use. And this, this stuff, just these little things, do so much to make Cantha feel like a real place with lots of history, don't they? And this is one of the things I think, on the small scale, Guild Wars 2 was lacking a little bit. Just a little bit. I mean, Guild Wars 2 has a lot of that going on as well, just because it can build off of prophecies and I don't know. Is that the guy from Key to Mance? Wow, you just blew my mind. Is it? I don't think so. I mean, that's a Mesmery mission as well. Is that Keita from Key to Mance? It could be. That's a weird thought. Why would the spirit have moved, though? 
Why would, how would Zaitan have done and got that? I'm not sure whether that's right. Maybe Keita from Keita Manth was named, was a different character, but their namesake was this Canton hero, perhaps? Uh, we have more story here as well. I'm going to be really bad at chat, but the game's going to wrap a ton of lore at us, so I have to wrap it out. Shiro has bonded the heroes uh, into these creatures. It's worse than blasphemy. Shiro plays in the fields of the gods. Rest assured, master, we will make him pay for what he has done and what he plans to do. If anyone can stop Shiro, it's you. Good luck, friend, said Kita. We must proceed with caution. The guardians see us as neither friend nor foe, but they will kill us if they perceive we're a threat. Uh, so yeah, there's the guardians of the temple. They're elementalists that are fighting us. So here's the next hero. I can't remember which. We'll see in a second. Brash and impulsive in his youth. Naku was a known criminal in his home village in Eastern Kantha. When the Tengu Wars began, so this is very recent, Naku joined... Oh, no, not necessarily. They closed recently. They could have been enacted a long time ago. Naku joined the Kanthan army in an effort to protect his family and his shady business interests. Years of war gave him a new perspective on the nature of life and death, and eventually, Naku became a respected general, using his now considerable necromancer powers against the Tengu who resisted Kanthan rule. When Kanamantu, the village of his birth, was destroyed, Naku returned to his home and raised a vast army of minions from the corpses of his relatives and childhood playmates, then sacrificed his life to drive them directly to the enemy. Look at that, a sacrifice skill so potent. Can you imagine, that never became a thing, but I wonder if the designers were playing that when factions came out. An elite necro death magic skill that is 100% life sacrifice, but puts a frenzy buff on your minions. That's totally within scope of the game, but they uh, and totally could have worked. But maybe they uh, they didn't want to play with it. Interestingly, you know Verata and all the Verata Guild Wars one Necro skills and the Veratan Cult and stuff. There is if you through data mining, I think it was, go to the Guild Wars one wiki. There's a fascinating place uh, with lots of cut and old content, and there's many skills listed there that never made it into the game. For example, Mesma has one less elite skill for prophecies than anyone else because it they deleted one before the game came out. I think it's Mesma. And you can learn what these skills were. One of them was a necro skill that was like a, a turbocharged buff for your minions, but they never added in the end. Uh, and I wonder whether the same philosophies behind that is what made them not create the elite version for Cantha. But it's a cool thought, isn't it? It makes sense as an elite skill, especially considering, remember, skills were named after these guys. So it would be like, um, what's this here? It's called Naku. It'd be like Naku's, Naku's End or something, an elite necro skill. Speaking of elite skills, by the way, we could cap one here. Instead, he has Whale of Doom. We're not going to get this because this is a PvP skill. For one second, all of Target Foe's attributes are set to zero. It's an amazing Team Arena skill. Back in the day, I don't know that anymore. Uh, it reappears in Guild Wars 2 on the Warhorn for Necro, and it's kind of the same thing, it, sort of. It's a daze, that lo a long-lasting daze, especially if you trade it. And the idea is it's supposed to approximate the same as what the Guild Wars 1 Elite did, but really the, the systems aren't connected in any way, so yeah. Naku means to cry. Oh, that's very sweet. Right, what else we got? Uh, I shudder to think what would have happened had you not released me from the spirit binder. You have my gratitude, and I shall lend my strength to Vizu. So each time we do it, these guys, they're helping out. It's too much, too quick, guys. I don't think I'm going to be able to uh, read it all for you. We'll try. A hundred years ago, a demon came to Kantha. He was called Mang, and he found himself... By the way, just demons. Demon lore we don't get much of anymore. He was called Mang, and he found himself uh, flesh after a foolish young necromancer named Juedo attempted a forbidden ritual and succeeded against all odds. For years, Mang terrorized the countryside, despite the best efforts of Kantha's premier mages to outsmart him. On a wi one winter day, Tanai, then a bold young student, approached her headmaster with a plan. The next day, she herself lured Mang to the shore of a great lake, the surface of which was frozen solid. She walked out onto the ice and Mang followed, eventually reaching the center while Tanai continued to the other shore. As he did... Wait, has the gender of this character just swapped? Tanai raised, oh no, as the demon did, Tanai raised her hand and fire rained down upon onto the icy lake and Tanai shrieked a command. The lake froze solid around Mang's thrashing form and he was trapped. Now lightning and boulders finished the job, only Tanai had known how to begun and Mang was returned to the underworld. Tanai, after a long and successful life as an elementalist, was ensconced in the Tanakai temple. It's almost Guild Wars 2 elementalism there, using all the different elements. Um, reminded me of a certain TV show there as well, actually, a little bit there, with the icy lake. Moving over here, we got a stone pedestal up. 
I like the idea that in Guild Wars 2 they could do an event where that demon is summoned. <laughs> Accidentally. This was a monk. Karai was a powerful leader who lived 700 years ago. For most of his life, he tended a small village in northern Cantha, curing ills and setting broken bones, refusing pay and accepting only food and basic supplies from the community. One day, a wealthy Cantha noble and his, small on and his small entourage passed by Karai's village and were attacked by bandits in the nearby woods. The noble suffered a grievous wound, and after killing the bandits, his guards brought him to Karai, who healed him easily. When the wealthy man attempted to pay him in gold, the monk refused. Next, the noble offered the Kurai employment on his lavish estate, and again, the monk refused. Finally, the noble offered to give the monk a great powers that would make him a god among men, but Kurai would not be moved. Smiling, the noble stood and let his cloak fall away, and as he did, he was transformed into a beautiful woman. The goddess Dwayna herself stood before Kurai and placed a hand upon his head. Thrice I have tempted you, and thrice you have resisted. I choose you. Called by his goddess, Karai could not refuse his new appointment as master of the Kaizen Monastery, where he lived out his days training young monks and healing any sick or broken who came his way. Upon his death, Duena herself... I can do this. Listen, you're about to see my amazing intellect. I have to go to graphics, interface size, normal. Boom. Duena herself inducted him into Tanakai. And now we'll make it big again. Beautiful. Look at that. Look at that obscure random shit I still know how to fix. <laughs> Me, an intellectual. Okay. Moving on. Uh, that's cool as well, by the way. That seems very Lissa-esque. I like the idea that that's actually false narration, unreliable narration through the years, and that the truth is it's been muddied. It's weird thinking of the gods interacting with the humans down here. And that any Guild Wars 2 expansion would do wonderful stuff to talk about that at this point. Uh, I shudder what to think what would have happened. We must destroy each construct. The binding, binding the Canthan heroes was a clever move by Shiro, but I'm afraid that it is just a taste of what is to come. Quickly, it looks like the constructs are attempting to bind Vizu. We must hurry. We have very little time. We actually have tons. The team's going really quick. I believe that Vizu has the knowledge of Shiro helped her to take part in his destruction 200 years ago. That knowledge will help us destroy him once again. So yeah, we have to find Vizu. Here's a great one. This is the warrior one. This is a very famous one that defined a lot of what we did in Path of Fire and the devs lean on. Read carefully. Oh no, it's not. I'm thinking of the wrong one. We will get it soon though. Jayazi Anju was an exceptionally tall and very strong young warrior who lived over 300 years ago. Orphaned at birth and self-trained, he traveled Cantha and single-handedly defeated bands of monsters that threatened villages all over the countryside. This is so Monster Hunter to me at the moment. I'm playing too much of that game, I guess. Uh, when the Emperor invited her to visit him in the um, Forbidden City so he could reward her, she arrived days late, having stopped to defend an orphanage from a scale invasion. Standing before the Emperor's throne, she refused his proffered reward and instead offered her sword and her life in exchange for the insult of tardiness. The bemused Emperor refused her offer and she continued to defend the weak until her death five years later, by which time legends numbered her kills in the tens of thousands. The Emperor himself petitioned the Oracle to give her a place in the Tanakai Temple, and so it was. Interesting story. I'm not quite sure I read that correctly, or my brain is just too frazzled to have fully followed it. By the way, that's not all the lore. If you watch my LP, I go into it conclusively, but you can actually speak to each spirit as well, and they all have special lore too. I dishonored myself only once while I lived, and that was by choice. Never have I allowed evil to control my actions, and I will not begin to ga begin again today. Does that mean she didn't have the favor of the Empress? Emperor? Right, moving on. We now have another stone pedestal. We'll get to Kaolai soon, and that's the special one. Believe you me, guys. Five hundred years ago, Canton Forest began, one by one, to shrivel and turn black. All life within them sucked try. This is interesting, almost like a precursor of the Jade Wind. Zhou Jun, a legendary ranger even then, sought to discover the cause of the, the, cause of the forest's destruction and eventually discovered that an evil wizard, Magador, was sucking life from Canthus Forest and converting it into magical energy, which he planned to use to power a great magical war against the Canthan Emperor. Listen to this, this is crazy, such high fantasy. All these random tangents and stories, it's so cool. 
Uh, Zojun called upon his fellow rangers, and together they swept through the Canther's remaining forests, charming every beast of any size that crossed their paths. Legends tell of a great bestial army that thundered across the land and grew in size until every creature in Canther had joined its ranks. When the rangers and their allies arrived at the entrance of Magador's lair, the sheer weight of their numbers collapsed the earth and Magador was crushed beneath them. The life he had stolen rose out of the ground and returned to the forests, which instantly flourished once again. Listen to that. Imagine if they expand on that in Guild Wars 2. That's fucking cool. And a bit of story I'd completely forgotten about. You never hear anyone talking about that. I certainly don't, because I forgot about it. You're cool, Zojin. Once I led an entire army of charmed creatures against a powerful wizard and defeated him without a single arrow. But that was long ago. Now I'm bound to this construct and I'm unable to control my own actions. You know, what's interesting is because there's like this reverence for heroes and this ability to communicate with heroes in Cantha, this whole idea of unreliable narration, maybe that's not fair. If so there's a spirit right now here today who we can speak to who will testify to having been met by Dwayna. Unless we are to call that character a liar, it must be true that Dwayna genuinely did appear as Lissamite to one of them. An attempt to uh, deceive them. Maybe that's more of a godly thing than anything else. Here, this is a writ, and I'm going to capture straight away so people aren't freaking out in chat to make me capture this. Stick it out. It's another restoration ability. This is another item spell. Hold Jinrei's ashes. Defiant was Jinrei. While we hold her ashes, we cannot lose more than 20% of our max health from a single hit. And when we drop them, we steal health from everyone around her. So this is kind of like a, a weird version of protective spirit for the um, monk. It's really low energy. Only we can hold the ashes, so it can't be cast onto other people. Uh, and we can, like, permanently maintain it. This is kind of a farm thing that's not quite good enough to be a great farm thing. So it would be a niche build. I doubt you'll see me use in this series. Perhaps for early pulls if we had a very coordinated setup or Hero's Hench that I have complete flag control over. But I doubt you'll see me run it much. Anyway, stone pedestal. When the gods walked Tyria a thousand years ago, the ritualist Kaolai, an old man even then, challenged Balthazar to a game of Nui in exchange for sparing a village that had offended the god through some long forgotten breach of et etiquette. So the game of Nui, I'm not sure if that's a real world reference or that's a game that's in universe and they could potentially build in Guild Wars 2. Anyway, a lot of the Balthazar's motivation and stuff, and whether it's authentic or Lissa manipulated for contemporary Guild Wars 2 story, hinges on this story. This is one of the only places of a truly callous Balthazar we actually have. So, be prepared for this to eventually be revealed to be Lissa having orchestrated or what, I don't know, but here we go. So, Kaolai has enraged Balthazar through some long-forgotten breach of etiquette. Straight away, Balthazar seems like a bit of a dick. But going on, Balthazar laughably accepted, and the so he challenged him to a game of Nui. Balthazar laughingly accepted, and the game began. Seven days later, it ended, with Kaolai the winner. So look at that, a fallible god. The villagers were spared, but in a fit of anger, Balthazar slew Kaolai. Afterward, in a rare gesture of sportsmanship, the god ordered Kaolai inducted into Tanakai Temple. So, you know, there's two sides of Balthazar there. He's fallible. What you got to remember, when, when people, uh, what's the words, trot this story out in contemporary lore discussion about how authentic Balthazar is in Path of Fire, when that happens, and people point back to this, they lose the context of how this was placed into the game. And what I mean by that, is every single one of these little stories has been a decidedly obscure little thing that people don't talk about and has had absolutely no relevance to anything else. A wizard that steals magic from the forest and then it returns. Uh, you know, all these little things. It, it's all about... It, it's kind of there to be obscure. So remember that, right? This is not a, a be-all and end-all... Oh, Balthazar was a dick in Path of Fire, and he was always a dick. Look at this. It, it's not fair to look at this stone pedestal and hand wave everything. Which is why I'm hoping that there's a, something further going on, and the devs are smarter than hand waving everything. Oh, good timing, I guess. There you go. They've saved Vizu. <laughs> and there you go. We're denied a bit of story, but there you go. Though I knew someday Shiro would return. I wish secretly this day would never come. I 
recognize you. The Emperor has spoken to me of his half-brother, the man known as Master Togo. Tell me what you desire. If it's within my power, you shall have it. Two hundred years ago, on the day of the Jade Wind, you bested Shiro. We have come to you to learn how to do the same. Yes, it was my blade that finally turned the tide of battle on that day. But it was not me who struck the final blow. If you wish to destroy Shiro, you must find the Luxon champion Archimoris and the Kurzakiro victor, the two men who struck him down all those years ago. Where do we find them? The Luxons honor their great champion by keeping his spirit in a powerful spear, which passes between the clans. The Kurziks guard the urn of their hero with a vigorous zeal. Seek out these two artifacts, for if you have them both, the spirits inside can show you how to defeat Shiro. Thank you, Vizu. It has been my honor to talk with you. I wish our visit could have been longer. Do not worry on such things, Togo. There will be plenty of time for us to talk once Shiro has been defeated. You can count on that. Can we just credit her of not having totally ass voice acting? Yay, <laughs> in the way it's implemented. Look at Charlie, he made it to 2018. Yeah, indeed he did. All right, more more flashbacks. I'll get to chat very soon, guys. Rit is good. Someone asked me how good Rit is. It's fun. I like Ritualist a lot. Hmm, you have returned. Good, good. Sit. I shall tell you your future. The Emperor has his eye on you. Me? Why would the Emperor be watching me? Your good work has not gone unnoticed. He thinks you are trustworthy and brave. But what does it mean? Why is he watching? You, Shiro, will be rewarded for your service. You shall be singled out for something very important. When? Soon. Very soon. Yeah, Vizu is only good because of the contrast. You have served me well, warrior. Thank you, my emperor. A man of your considerable fighting prowess should play a more important role in Canton Empire, don't you think? My lord? Why should your talents be spent defending the merchants from bandit raids when they could be put to a better use? I... I do not fully understand. Rise, Shiro Tagachi, and take your place beside me as my personal bodyguard. So there you go. Important, important backstory right there. Okay. Uh, read the rest of them from Wiki. We don't have to. You can read all of them at your leisure after the instance is done. That's what I was trying to express earlier. Um, yes, yeah, somebody else said spoilers. The urn and the spear are crap. You're absolutely right. This is kind of terrible. Factions, again, it's not just that the voice acting is bad. In general, it's a really poorly delivered story. I mean, I'm not trying to kill people's enthusiasm or anything. The world and the setting and stuff is great, and we can enjoy that and, you know, greedily devour that. But the actual, like, the pace of everything, it's, 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 it's bad, guys. And you're about to see how bad it is. They're about to waste probably the next four or f uh, three or four hours of the campaign on a complete tangent and dead end. They really are. And it would be such a simple thing, narratively, to have not done. But they're going to do it anyway. Or to have refined and fixed. It's bad. And it, it stays as shallow as it currently is, for what it's worth. Yeah, let's chase Shiro. It's still better than Prophecies, I'll, I'll, I'll note. Prophecies was even worse because it, it, it was like the reverse of factions. It was like ADD, like, now do this. Now this. Now this. Now this. Do this one, this one. And it's like... It's got no base, it's got no coherency to it whatsoever, while also being shallow. At least this has a co coherent shallow depth to it. 
But uh, yeah, so um, you know they were learning, and all of a sudden they hit it out of the fucking park with Nightfall. Uh, when, when Nightfall came around, they were just like, "Oh, this is how you build an RPG." Boom. So yeah, there you go, and we are now at the Zinku Corridor, which leads us out of the city. Woo! We did basically get to where I wanted to get on today's stream. Not too bad, honestly. Not too bad at all. Uh, so yeah, we, we do have some more quests and little things we can do. We've got a ton of rewards we can do. Now that we're level 20, this feels wholly unnecessary and uninteresting. But next next stream, we, we can open up with a new build. I hardly got to touch this. I mean, I can't believe how well Spirit Rift tied the whole thing together, funnily enough. You know, it balanced us energy-wise. Just everything about it was good. Uh, mixed a little bit more AoE in with our single target. I don't know. Um, but yeah, we will start using runes and things as well. Uh, we can also visit the god realms now, for what it's worth, because we're at the temple after becoming Wayno Sue at the start of the stream. Uh, so there's all kinds of fun things. We can read more of that lore. If I keep trying to do more now, though, after you know coming up on two and a half hours of constantly talking, it's going to hurt my throat a bit. So I'll leave that. I'm going to go uh, get to getting the next episode of the LP up. Uh, which is another really long episode, by the way. It's about an hour and 20 minutes. It's long. It will take a while to finish uploading and processing, so uh, hang out for it. But it's a fun one. It gives you a ton of exploration into areas of the game you probably haven't explored well enough before. Uh, so, yeah. Sort of a best of the best who's who of Iron Marches, Fireheart, and some other stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, anything in chat? Have I missed anything really important in chat someone wants an answer to? Because if not, I will uh, I'll basically be signing out. It's good to see. I can I just say again, I'm really appreciative of everyone who's been showing up each time. It's Guild Wars 1. Not anyone's really interested. We're in a, we're in a niche of a niche right here. So it's awesome to see people hanging out and uh, making this a fun project to do. I'll also note, in terms of projects, by the way, uh, it did dawn on me through someone on Discord that we never fully properly did the Season 1, uh, the Episode 1 playthrough for Season 4. We did stuff on the on Istan and the map and we did like highlights of the various features and stuff but the actual like three campaign instances and going to Farron and stuff I didn't do those streams in the end so once we beat factions the straw poll will include that as an opportunity for us and we'll see um, you need to catch up on like five episodes since you've been away well get to it do it to it yeah congrats on 20 thank you very much it's good to see you all cheers guys Hope you had fun, and um, yeah, before you know it, we'll be back. Oh, look at everybody waving. Everybody started waving. It's brilliant. We've got Ogden with us as well. That's ruining my immersion, Ogden. It ruins my immersion even more than Koss and this guy from the Ministry of Purity tra time traveling. There's two cool people here. Two. The rest of you should be ashamed. This guy's still level 19. I'm quite impressed with that, Kimrisa. Okay, catch you guys next time. See yous.